The March 13th meeting of the Scarborough Planning Board will come to order, please. Please rise to the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Doreen, you please call the roll. Jim Hebert. Here. Rachel Henriksen. Here. Jennifer Ladd. Here. Rick Duperry. I mean, Richard Meinking. I'm here. <laughs> and Roger Bealey. And he's on mute. Roger is here on mute. We can see him up there, so we know he's here. Um, as an update, uh, Rick Duperry, who's been on the planning board for, uh, I believe, six years, uh, has resigned. Um, Noah Perlett is not here tonight. That moves uh, Jim Hebert uh, to a voting member. Next item on the agenda, approval of the minutes of February 21st, 2023. Do I hear a motion? Oh, you are. Um, Madam Chair, I make a motion to accept. I'll second. And second from Jim Hebert. Any corrections or additions? Hearing none, please uh, call for the vote, Doreen. Rachel Henriksen? Yes. Jim Hebert? Yes. Jennifer Ladd? Yes. Rick Mineking? Yes. And Roger Bealey? I, I wasn't, I don't think I was there. <laughs> Oh, uh, that's okay. They are minutes are approved. The next item on the agenda is uh, <coughs> notice that item number 501, 5.01, the Maine Coastal Protection Project uh, has been tabled at the request of the applicant. Next item on the agenda. Let me get down here. Uh, is the uh, this is still wrong. This is yeah. We're going to take things out of order uh, depending on which application form you have. I mean, excuse me, on which uh, agenda form you have. And we're going to begin with the downs and the subdivision request for uh, Crossroads Holding, requesting preliminary subdivision review of a 32 acre five lot subdivision at Scarborough Downs. The property is further identified as assessor's map R52 lot four. We're going to be kind of bunching these linking these elements together because in the case, uh, in two cases, one item must be discussed first before the second item can be reviewed. So for instance, for the hotel, uh, which has two applications in two was, we're going to take a look at the sketch plan first and then look at the gravel request. And for the downs, we will look at the downs subdivision request first and then move to the affordable housing request. So for the downs, for the town. Thank you. Uh, so the, uh, the Crossroads Holdings has submitted a preliminary subdivision application for a five lot subdivision at Scarborough Downs. Um, this follows a uh, November, 2022 master plan approval for the town center. Um, the subdivision would include a mix of commercial office, restaurant and retail uses, uh, and would be followed by a final subdivision application and uh, site plan approvals for each lot. Um, staff has uh, included comment with respect to traffic and bypass road detail, uh, as well as parking and other engineering items. And with that, I would turn it back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And I should point out for those folks who are watching, uh, as well as those in the room, that this is a preliminary request. It is a preliminary review. Uh, it's almost as though we're doing a sketch plan for a subdivision. Uh, we do not expect to take a vote tonight, but instead to have a good conversation 
with the applicant uh, on, so that we can reach a full understanding of what they're proposing. Thank you. Dan? Uh, good evening. Glad I came on time. Um, <clears throat> Dan Bacon here on behalf of Crossroads Holdings. Um, I do have a slideshow and I've logged in on Zoom. So um, if it's possible, I would share my screen. Thank you. Bring this up real quick. I'll get started. Is that visible? No, that's still your screen, isn't it? <clears throat> yeah. Share screen. Okay. I'm getting closer. Okay. Great. Well, thank you. Sorry for the delay. Uh, Dan Bacon here on behalf of Crossroads. I'm joined this evening uh, by Brian O'Connor uh, with Cube3, who the board's met, I believe, at Sketch Plan um, and has been to other meetings to talk about the town center. Uh, Drew Gagnon's here, um, who you know well from our civil team. And uh, Eric uh, Gitaboni, I believe, is on as a panelist. She's our transportation uh, engineer assisting on the project. She's here for questions, but um, if she's visible, you might want to let her in for Q&A section of the meeting or the presentation. And um, Rocky Rizbear is also here in person, a uh, partner with Crossroads. Um, so we're very excited this evening to kind of officially begin the, the subdivision review process for uh, the first phase of Town Center uh, that we've been working on for a couple of years now, actually, in the preliminary stages, conceptual stages. Um, as Eric indicated, we've had a master plan review and approval. We also had an initial sketch plan, kind of lay the framework out for this subdivision review process that we're starting this evening. Um, and kind of going back a bit further, we worked very closely with the downtown committee, uh, the town committee for almost a year on kind of design principles and approach to town center that's been able to inform um, our layout. And we were very appreciative of that process. And a lot of the, the principles and elements of this plan really came from, from that process. So, in terms of this evening, as indicated, this is really kind of a preliminary light meeting where we wanted to update the board on where we've come since sketch plan, um, cover really some key design approaches that we're taking around the street design, around traffic calming, um, explain the larger lots that we're creating uh, through subdivision or proposed to create through subdivision that will be further divided, further reviewed by the board through site plan in some ways similar to the innovation district. Um, and one of, the, one of those lots is actually later on your agenda, as you know, uh, 3i home for a sketch plan review, and then walk through um, kind of the other key elements of subdivision, uh, stormwater utilities, recognizing that we're working more with staff uh, in the next few weeks to update these preliminary plans and resubmit them um, to kind of have an incremental review with you. Uh, as the board and also working with the peer review engineers. There's a fair amount of content. Um, so we thought it was appropriate to have this kind of two-step preliminary process. So just to, to kind of remind the board and the public uh, viewing where we're talking about, uh, this larger kind of blue boundary is the overall town center um, district that was approved under the master plan. And at this point we're talking about um, that first phase of town center really to activate the first initial uh, lots and to extend Scrubber Downs Road up from where it is today um, to the north and then Market Street out to uh, where it's under construction out towards Haggis Parkway. So we're really talking about um, um, only a portion or percentage of the overall town center area 
um, as this phase one. This helps kind of paint the picture a bit better. Um, this is our conceptual master plan that we've shared with the board and with uh, the public. We also use it for marketing so people understand kind of the, the end goal with the town center layout. These are obviously conceptual, um, conceptual level, really to show the pattern of development planned and the kind of the general configuration of the town center. Um, so this will be refined through subdivision and through site plan review, but we wanted to use this so you, the board understands kind of the area that we're talking about in red and the general uh, direction of, of layout. Um, so on the right side of the screen is uh, the, the residential area well under construction. And then so again, we extend Scrubber Downs Road um, through this phase from kind of right to left and then Market Street out to where it um, leaves off today towards Haggis Parkway. So getting into a bit more detail, and this actually rotates the view 90 degrees. So um, I changed the orientation on you, um, but this is this shows um, more specifically the road layout. Um, so the bottom of the screen is now Town Center Residential. Scarborough Downs Road is running kind of north south, um, top to bottom, on this screen, um, and we're proposing five lots at this point in this first town center phase. And again, these lots are larger lots. Um, they're development areas, which will be further divided and reviewed by the board as individual sites um, come before you. But we have a large, um, I'm not gonna go in order one through five, I'm gonna go kind of um, screen bottom to, to, to top, but coming up from um, town center, we have a larger lot, uh, lot four, uh, which we anticipate to be uh, likely multifamily housing, um, just north of the American House uh, Senior Living Facility that's um, approved just to the south of this, this, um, this lot. On the left side of the road is actually a, a lot that will define the area of the second pump station that's, that's uh, almost complete, like 99% complete at this point. Um, that's been under construction for the past year or so to serve this area of the project, um, as well as um, additional area. That's a small lot and that's lot five. Um, lot one is next kind of moving up the screen. And this is the lot that would include uh, 3i home and also a mixed use building and some associated parking and development that we anticipate uh, to be on lot one, as well as some, a stormwater, a larger stormwater BMP uh, gravel wetland, which is this kind of stared shape here, um, which borders lot one. And then lot three is across from lot one and just to the north of lot four. And that's where we anticipate kind of the central square. Um, really kind of the, the heartbeat and the hub of the town center. At this point, it's being laid out simply as a lot and we're working on design and programming uh, to come before the board in the future with the specifics of the central square and the development that would occur uh, in that location. And then lot two is the area that's um, the top of the screen and that's north of lot one and on the other side of Market Street. Um, and so, those are the, again, the larger lots that we're creating at this point, and then we'll come before you um, with further detail on each of those. This is simply a graphic and I've highlighted already kind of the, the direction of um, development and land use as we anticipate on these lots. And these are just simply so you can help visualize a bit where we anticipate uh, building development because looking at a subdivision without a sense of where buildings go um, isn't all that helpful, but the subdivision process is that process where we're just creating the lots and the road infrastructure and then you of course review um, the lots in buildings site plan by site plan. So this is really kind of to give you a general sense of proximity locations of where we anticipate buildings to be similar to the master plan. Um, that can aid in your review as we look at the subdivision. 
So in terms of the street network, and you actually saw this at your at your last sketch plan review, um, this shows you more than this initial phase uh, of development, but we thought it was important to kind of remind the board of this um, as we narrow back down to phase one. We're thinking about phase one with phase two and larger kind of street grid design in mind. Um, so we wanted to bring this up before we kind of jump into more details around phase one in that we're designing these roads initially um, in the case of cross street, the street that comes off a of downs road as a dead end, but it's only a temporary dead end. You know, it will be extended to tie into um, roads to the east. Similarly, Scarborough Downs Road, when it passes Market Street for now, we're designing it as a dead end, at least from a, a public street standpoint, recognizing that Downs Road will be extended in a future phase up towards the Innovation District. Um, and similarly to that, we're anticipating um, a grid layout on the, um, really the, I guess it's the left quadrant of town center that we're only starting with lot two today. And we're gonna be working with staff and the board on right away connections, road connections that will extend in the future to create that um, road network and provide alternative routes um, other than going through just the Scarborough Downs market intersection given there's a lot of goals for that intersection. We wanna make sure we can keep that a pedestrian um, intersection, really kind of the, the people hub of town center, which we're kind of highlighting is yellow here um, by providing these alternate routes over time as we phase town center. So this is getting into a bit more detail on street design, which is in your packages for phase one. And we talked a lot at master plan about kind of traffic calming and gateways into the town center from all directions. This, this shows you um, the Southern direction or the gateway from the South to into town center. And so this is really, as you come up the Downs Road um, from town center residential. And we've uh, included, you know, after discussion with the planning board, um, a traffic calming measure, a gateway treatment with a crosswalk with a center island, um, right as you kind of come into town center uh, to slow traffic, to cue that you're coming into a more congested area where there's gonna be on, more on-street parking, pedestrian priority, et cetera. So that's the, the feature here um, with a crosswalk that'll link both sidewalks on both sides of the street. It also provides a really key linkage to our trail system to the west um, that will go out towards Haggis Parkway that'll link to the Allagash lot. Um, and is really kind of one of our key passive recreational amenities. So it's intentional in terms of where that crosswalk is with a protected center island. In addition to that, um, we've designed for on-street parking in every location that's possible, um, recognizing we need to have some separation from driveways and, and, and whatnot. And that's really the kind of the nature of this uh, street design as you enter town center from the south. So that gateway treatment on street parking that can serve development on both sides, um, a multi-use path on the left side per the master plan and a sidewalk on the right side of the road per the master plan. And you see lot four on, on the right, uh, lot five and, and lot one. This is up. Um, a half a block or so further up uh, the Downs Road that shows you the continuation of that uh, street cross section um, on street parking again to serve development on both sides of the street. Um, that multi-use path uh, comes up on the left side of Downs Road um, and actually in this vicinity converts into makes really more of a urban sidewalk street with even an additional space uh, for pedestrians. And, um, and then you see the cross street um, kind of going left to right on your screen and crosswalks and at this key intersection, um, both cross street and downs road. And, and then you'll see um, the beginning of, or part of lot three, which is that sort of central square location. Um, those crosswalks are intentional to be key connection points, both sides of the street to that future central square. 
and the, and again on street parking on the top of the screen. And this is the last um, street design slide that shows you the remainder of the street um, proposal for this phase. So Downs Road continues up. Um, we're going to talk in more detail about the actual intersection of Market and Downs. And Brian and Drew are going to do that um, in this specific design approach we have there for, for pedestrians and calming traffic. Um, but that's shown there, the three-way intersection. And then Market Street goes left to right on the screen um, and a very similar street cross section. So the closest to town center, you have those wide sidewalks on street parking, um, so tree wells, more urban design to street trees um, on that half of Market Street, if you will. And then two different locations for crosswalks with um, center islands. And those crosswalks are located intentionally close to these future um, road connections to the north. You see those arrows that are showing the intention of um, right of ways that will be um, in, introduced onto lot two to provide that future street network uh, to the north and to the east. Um, and so those crosswalks are intentionally located actually on the town center side of those intersections um, because there's left turn lanes shown on the other side to provide capacity um, and invite um, cars and visitors who aren't necessarily headed to town center to kind of take lefts and use those that future route um, to go around town center um, while also providing capacity for cars to kind of continue on and go into town center. So um, those left turn lanes are designed intentionally to provide a fair amount of capacity really to kind of enable that movement to be um, more free uh, than, than going straight if there is a reason to to bypass town center. So I think that's my segment of the presentation. I'm gonna have Brian uh, jump up and talk a bit about the intersection proper and, and Central Square and Market and Downs. Bye. Good evening, <clears throat> Brian O'Connor uh, from Cube3. Working, working with the team here for quite a while on this. Um, we're gonna give you a little bit of relief from the black and white with two pages of color graphics and that's it. Um, but what, what we really wanna do is take a little bit of a step back here and really support a lot of the engineering and thought process that's going into street width and dimensionality and the very, you know, really strong engineering here. I, I think when we think about lot three in this central square, I think it's important to remember through the, the process here, what we're trying to accomplish as a team. And, and this sort of idea of creation of sense of place and what it means to be here and how it's gonna feel to be here is something that we're making a really deliberate effort to have happen in conjunction with the engineering. We don't wanna have like a great idea collectively as a team, then engineer it and sort of forget about the experiential piece of it. So we're trying to do these things together. And just to remind everyone quickly, you know, this lot three is really about uh, a central amenity space that has lawn areas. Um, and, and again, this is conceptual. So this is still evolving. And you'll even see one graphic on the next page that looks a little bit different than this. But, you know, we're a mix of lawn areas and hardscape to create the opportunity for really rich and flexible programming uh, through the seasons and through the years as the project changes and evolves and matures with additional development. Number three in the middle there is a light retail building, which you'll see in another image here that we're still working on the design and programming of. Uh, we have active street front retail on both sides of Downs here, which I think is critical. And, and probably the most important piece that we're gonna talk about just for a minute here is that sort of um, blue, uh, square in the middle. This is really that primary intersection Dan mentioned between Downs and Market. And what we're trying to do here is propose a raised intersection um, for this area. It's another traffic calming measure. Drew's going to do a much better job than I could in describing what that actually means from a technical standpoint. But at the end of the day, what, what we want to do is really support this idea of pedestrian priority and this idea of programming and relationships across streets that create this sense of place. And so at building three up there, we, we see 
sort of a mix of indoor and outdoor uses that are going to be fed from activity and vibrancy on Market Street and along the right, the lower edge of Downs. Uh, we see restaurant use and other light use on the lower right-hand corner of that intersection, uh, hopefully in conjunction with the development of that mixed use building, as well as retail kind of dribbling down the street and feeding that last slide that Dan showed as we have more retail experience down market. So at, at the end of the day, I think we still see this as a real hub to the development. We think the execution of this intersection is really critical to the character and the quality of this place. And if we jump really quickly, do I do this, Dan? Or? Yep, there we go, to the next image. So these are two very quick shots of what that intersection is starting to evolve into. Um, they're a little hard to see here. So next time you see us, we'll have a lot more design work that goes with this, but we're looking down market towards that main intersection. And what you see on the right-hand side is the beginnings of the mixed use building. You can see that it's sort of peeled back uh, at that corner, creating this rich outdoor potential dining experience for a restaurant that's corner located with outdoor seating wrapping around the corner. And then on the other side uh, in the building, we haven't spent any time really talking about yet anchoring that other corner. As we look across the intersection there, you can start to see it's orange right now, which it won't be, but this sort of rich outdoor space that exists in a large covered pavilion area flanked by these active uses on either side that really start to create this rich blend of indoor and outdoor spaces. All of this is sort of around the idea of making sure that pedestrians can flow smoothly and not feel like they're taking their lives into their own hands. So you've got parallel parking on either side of market. You can see we've got tree wells, wide sidewalks, very deliberate crossing areas. And I think the notion of treating this intersection differently and treating it as a raised intersection to really support uh, this idea is something that I think Drew can probably explain in a little bit more detail. But I think we really just wanted to set the table for what we're thinking for this area. And uh, we're really excited about where this is going. So. Good evening, Drew Gagnon with Coral Palmer. Um, I do apologize, we're back to the black and white slides, um, but I do have a little bit of hatching on there. So it's, it's a little bit out of my comfort zone here, but we'll try our best. So um, Brian did a really good job of kind of setting the scene for this intersection. And we've been talking about it a lot from the initial sketch plans is we have to have some sort of design congestion here, right? So we're providing bypass lanes on other lots, we're providing um, additional capacity at other intersections as we lead up to this intersection. Pedestrians are completely the priority at this intersection. So what you're going to see and what I'm going to walk you through is really kind of starting at that standpoint and then working backwards into, okay, how do we create a safe intersection with appropriate lanes and tapers and things that everyone can be comfortable about. So as Brian mentioned, we're proposing a raised intersection here. It's about four inches in raised. Um, that follows the main DOT raised crosswalk policy. Um, as you can see, we're proposing a material change across the crosswalks at all uh, legs of the intersection here. The ramps are these dash lines, and these were also provided in your package. Uh, they're going to be at about 4%, so they're eight-foot ramps. Um, and that's really a um, little bit less steep than the DOT guidance, but we're doing that intentionally to assist with plowing and other public works needs. And we think that this will still create um, that traffic calming future of that level change um, all while providing for, you know, realistic um, snow plowing and other activities like that. So we have a stop controlled intersection completely here. So all three legs. So the bottom, uh, bottom road here is Scarborough Downs Road, Market Streets, perpendicular up and down on the page there. Um, so we're proposing a one way or excuse me, an always stop single lane approach for each intersection. Um, so we're we intentionally left out a little bit of the traffic analysis in this first um, application. We wanted to meet with the town first and kind of walk through our um, our ideas and our thoughts behind the analysis. So that's going to be provided in the next submission in a much more detailed um, setting. But we've done a complete capacity analysis of the downs in this intersection and what we think is from a trip end standpoint is actually going to come through this intersection. And we've kind of worked backwards from there and making sure that we've got adequate capacity so that um, this intersection designs uh, is designed and, and works in, in real life, right? Because this is just kind of the page setting at this point. Um, so we've done this intentionally. 
And we think that an always, um, it always stop single lane approach intersection is gonna work for the full build out of the downs. Uh, given that there's so many different assumptions that goes into that, we're talking about years out, we're talking about projected trips. We've designed this intersection as in cross slopes and, cross slopes and infrastructure such that it can be expanded for additional lanes in the future if necessary. So one example of that would be on Market Street here. Um, currently there's on-street parking proposed as close to the intersection as we're comfortable with. Um, and with a little bit of curb rework, so I call it minimal rework, we could have a left and a right out at that intersection um, and just a little bit of expansion into the paver area here. So with that being said, the cross slopes are really the key, the drainage infrastructure, all these items are really the key to kind of set this up for the future. So that in the event that if we ever need something like this and we can monitor the intersection that we can, um, we can relatively easily produce this product. I'm gonna briefly talk about the stormwater and utilities here. So this is an overall utility plan. Uh, as Dan mentioned, the pump station 27 is at the south of the page here. Um, that's just about complete. And we're taking the gravity sewer line. It's a 15 inch line north, um, about a few hundred feet up to the intersection of Cross Street, which is for perspective is just gonna be north of where the grandstand building is currently right now. Um, a 12 inch sewer main is gonna be proposed beyond that. And a 12 inch sewer main is gonna be proposed in Cross Street. Uh, an eight inch sewer main is gonna be proposed in Market Street to serve all these lots via gravity because we've made the initial investment to, for the pump station at earlier stages. This is an existing six inch force main that comes down from pump station 26, which is the pump station just south of the innovation district. Um, we're gonna be collecting that in the gravity sewer line and feeding it to pump station 27, which eventually goes out the Highgate Parkway. This is all in line with the sewer master plan. We've been working with the Scarborough Sanitary District quite a bit on this. Um, and this is, our intention is to keep, as the subdivision grows, we keep chewing back that sewer line, if you will, um, to make sure that everything is served and there's no um, delayed um, production in any of that. We're gonna continue the 16 inch water main north on Downs Road as well. It currently ends just about where the pump station building is. Um, we're gonna continue that all the way up and eight inch water mains in Cross Street and Market Street as well. There's overhead power that exists just south of the pump station driveway currently today. Um, we're gonna be, and then there's actually a brace pole on the other side of the pump station driveway. So we're replacing the brace pole with a much larger pole and then adding one more just about 15 feet north of it before we drop underground for this entire subdivision. So we have to add another pole from uh, based on just essentially real estate on the pole for getting the risers up and down it. I know there was a comment in the staff memo on that and we're committed to going underground. It's just a matter of working with CMP on actually getting all the different risers because we're going three phase power underground um, and getting that real estate on the pole. So we're adding another pole just to be able to drop it down into the subsurface structures. This is an overall grading plan that shows the gravel wetland that Dan mentioned. I do want to mention this gravel wetland is fully approved by the DEP. Um, we received that permit back in 2020. Um, we're proposing the stormwater chloride mitigation system that we've been doing all along on the downs where it directs snow melt water uh, directly into the stream and flushes it as in Willow, uh, directly into Willowdale Brook and flushes it uh, during the winter parts of the years. And then the gravel wetland acts as your water quality treatment during the summer months. Um, it's been successful to date in this project and we're proposing it again here. Um, everything in this initial subdivision uh, is uh, stormwater runoff drains to this gravel wetland here. Um, a little portion of lot two up in the left-hand corner here will go to an isolated grass under drain soil filter. We left that off intentionally off this application because we're not proposing any lot disturbance as part of this. And that'll be come back in front of the board for when that site plan moves forward. Um, it just takes none of the road, just a little bit of the lots up here. This gravel wetland is also oversized to take additional area north and east of this development. Um, and we've sized the, the drainage infrastructure as well to accommodate the future flow um, and provided scorecards as well in our application. I think Dan's gonna wrap it up here. Thanks, Drew. Um, <clears throat> and actually we, we didn't mention it, but uh, obviously 3i Home is on the agenda this evening um, and they factored into the approach in terms of the 
uh, to the raised intersection, you know, thinking through ease of um, crossing, particularly for their, uh, their planned residents. And, and I know the central square is a key destination for that project. So we didn't bring that up as part of the earlier comments. Um, but in terms of next steps, um, essentially we're you know, gonna spend uh, much of the remainder of March and April working with staff and peer review. We've set up um, some specific meetings with the peer reviewers because so that they understand the background behind the design approach to, um, to town center, because uh, it's fairly intricate. Um, and have opportunities to kind of work through um, solutions and review before we come back to the board. Um, and we'll update the plans and we're anticipating, um, you know, allowing for um, some additional weeks. So we kind of have a late April uh, preliminary review versus an early April to enable that um, collaboration to occur. You'll also be starting to get applications for kind of sketch plans, similar to 3i Home um, for other sites over the course of April, May, June um, within town center, because we want those to track kind of right behind subdivision review and also help kind of give the board context for, for a lot layouts and, and uh, overall kind of town center development and design approach. So that will be occurring as we, develop plans and we anticipate um, lot four would be before you in early April, that, that lot essentially across from uh, 3i home and then likely later in April, uh, early May would be the mixed use building. Um, so uh, expect that to, to be coming before you and um, you'll get more color graphics and more interesting things to look at. Um, Brian will assure you of that. And um, all of this is kind of queuing up towards you know, hopefully a late May, early June approval um, so that we can start construction, you know, this summer construction season. Um, it's critical to kind of get the town center underway. Um, and also for um, 3i Home in particular, um, they have funding uh, requirements that they need to apply for through Maine Housing that has like an annual opportunity. So we're working hard with them on schedule to and that's why they're the first sketch plan for you to see um, so that they can kind of move through the process, address board concerns and comments and staff and be in position to, to apply to mean housing uh, later, this, later this season. So that's really what we see kind of as next steps. And this evening, we're eager to hear from the board on this initial preliminary, recognizing we're gonna be coming back to you, you know, with a tuned up preliminary submission um, in late April. So with that, I'll turn it back to, to you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Dan. Uh, this is an item that is available for public comment. Is there any member of the public in the room who would care to make a comment? Is there anybody online? No one online? No one dashing up to the front from the room? Public comment is is over. I will turn this over to to the board. Um, now is the, the chance to make sure that we're really clear on what this is going to look like because it sounds as though what we're starting off is the the beginning of a wave of sketch plans and applications coming in, and it's going to be uh, heavily dependent upon how we work through this uh, and move on to the, the actual construction requests. Rick, you wanna start? Sure. Um, Dan, you mentioned lot two, and I didn't hear what your proposed use is going to be. Is that mixed use or is it all commercial or what for lot two? Yeah, lot two, uh, we anticipate, if you look up on the screen, uh, Rick, we anticipate where you see it says lot two, you know, that end of lot two. Um, to be mixed use. Mixed so, use. yep. And then we anticipate maybe more commercial to the left. Um, lot two is likely to end up being, you know, potentially three lots. If you can picture those arrows being lot Okay, lines. so you're, you're thinking maybe that's going to get divided. Yep. Yep. Okay. And we're anticipating maybe it could be added onto to the north. But it's all mixed use. It's, it's not all residential. Correct. Okay. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, Let's see. Um, 
while you're doing this, will there be access to Route 1 from the Payne Road throughout the construction process um, just to make sure that the town residents can get from the Payne Road to Route 1 or vice versa if they needed to? Yeah, we're looking, we're working through where, uh, where the alignment would go. Um, that's something that we'd cover before final approval. To okay, provide, so uh, you'll have that all baked into your yeah, submission. That's really more of a construction sequencing plan yeah, um, yeah. that we intend to provide for, correct. Okay, yep. okay. Um, I was noticing on the plans that the pump station 27 was is under construction and it was approved in February 2nd of 2022. And I don't find in my records where we even had that on our agenda. Can you shed a little bit of light on how this pump station, and I assume there's a building on there? There is, yeah. Because um, I don't recall seeing any sort of plans or anything for that pump station. It was. I know we talked about it as yeah. part of what you needed to, to deal with uh, the, the waste, but I don't recall ever seeing anything for that particular lot. The, well, the lot wasn't created. So right now it's on overall crossroads land. Now we're creating the lot around it, but it was reviewed and approved as part of a, one of the residential phases that it serves. So, cause it serves. Okay. So it must've been way before February 2nd. Then. It was probably the fall that of 21 where the subdivision was reviewed okay. um, to approve it. I didn't look that far into my- Is that right? We probably need to update the plans then to, to historically recognize that it was approved back in 2021, not 2022. And the, just to clarify, the February 2022 approval is from the Scarborough Sanitary District. That was essentially- it, oh, okay. What That's that when the sanitary district said Correct. you had the capacity. They could they could manage the capacity. Yeah, and they approved our design for the pump station. Okay, but so still, I don't recall any any sort of plans before us on lot two, unless I'm my colleagues. I I don't know, but I kind of like to see what that's going to look like uh, when when it's fully built out. I mean, you you, you got to have some lighting there. You must have uh, a building. You got colors, what have you? Yeah. So, no. So will that be included in the next submission? It would be more of an as-built plan. Yeah, um. <laughs> it sounds like it has to be. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. I just wanted to, to bring that up. And I yeah. think, um, you know, staff has, staff and our peer reviewer has uh, laid out a number of, of things to, you know, go back to the, yeah. uh, and I'm not going to go over those and I'm certainly not going to, ask questions about the raised um, intersection there, although I think uh, that's got some cleverness to it. Um, and I, I, I think I can get along with this uh, kind of uh, uh, division of this area. I think you've put some thought into it. Um, I wanna make sure too that when you cross the stream with Market Street, you are now underground at that point all the way through on Market Street, correct? With your utilities? Yes. Um, Market Street is currently approved and under construction with overhead only on the highest end to right. the intersection. Right, and then once you cross the stream, it and goes And then it, we actually don't go any further. So power <laughs> comes from the town center side Okay, so um, power is going to come down from town center on four for lot one. Yeah, lot one and two, if you look by on the screen, lot one, two, one and two are served from the Downs Road and then um, within Market Street, all underground. It doesn't come, it's not coming from Haggis Parkway to serve this area of the okay, project. Got it, got yeah. it. Um, no, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I, you brought me along pretty good here. Um, it seems to make some sense. Uh, the hammer or the, I guess that could be called a hammerhead on Cross Street, I believe it is. Is there any, any insight on where that might end up going, Cross Street, once it gets beyond 
lot four or three. I was going to go to the network plan. So this can help. So again, orientation is different, but cross street is the, the right side of that U in yellow. Yep. We're showing cross street in yellow, you know, in this subdivision plan. And then we anticipate it's going to continue and connect to um, what likely would be front runner extension. So front runner today goes up from Downs Road, road through the residential phase. Um, and we anticipate it will be extended to connect with Cross Street. Um, Maybe you can superimpose that in the next submission just so that we start to see the grid layout sure. of what the, the downtown district looks like. That would, that yeah. would be helpful. Thanks. Uh, I think at this point, Madam Chair, I'm not gonna get into the traffic or anything. I have more esteemed colleagues that deal with that every day. Uh, so I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, and I will move to the esteemed colleague who understands traffic, Jen. Someday, Rick, I'm just going to come with all the lighting questions. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> okay. Uh, I'm. I guess my first question is: I know that in in some instances in other parts of the downs, you have um, <clears throat> by choice or by force. Um, put in roadway infrastructure first and come back uh, second with lot build out and in some other cases lot build out and then finishing um, with with the roadways and sidewalks and things like that. For this raised in intersection, what's the thought here? And I understand that we're that we're early on in the process um, and you're still as discussed working on um, ironing out the uses at that corner and probably tenants and things like that. Um, but I'm just curious about what the interim situation here would be like for a raised intersection. I can, uh, I can generally picture it fully built out. So with people using it, with people driving through it, with the sidewalk dining adjacent to it. Um, but in the event that any of those lag, um, I'm just curious, what your vision is for phasing here at kind of a high level um, in terms of construction. Sure. Um, if things go the way, uh, according to plan, there wouldn't be a significant lag. So if up on this graphic, uh, there's some arrows. So we're under design right now on this mixed use building, which is at the corner. Um, and I can bring up the pretty picture in a minute, but it's the one that Brian showed uh, the corner on the right with outdoor dining. So we're working on design pricing right now, conceptual design, and hope to be before the board to show you that, you know, through site plan this spring and hope to start construction on that uh, later this year. So we anticipate at the same time or not long after um, Market Street Downs Road, that intersection in is in, there's people using it. Um, we're also working on concepts for the central square, you know, and that may lag a little bit behind the mixed use building. Um, and again, we're doing the same exercise on pricing, but we think that's going to be activated, you know, similar in terms of timing. Also, you know, we're working on these resident, this residential site, we're calling lot four and anticipate even if that central square building is not complete, there's a lot of pedestrians coming up through the central square using that crosswalk. So we don't think this, we're going to have like a raised intersection there with surrounded by construction, you know, not have active people and active uses, um, at least for very long. Um, I think the least clear, as Brian indicated, is, is the building and site north of Market Street, because we first want to kind of tackle that, the one to the south. So that may lag some. Um, we want to be able to kind of lease up that first building, get some activity. Um, but at least, you know, two legs of this intersection are going to be activated, if you will, around the time that we're completing the intersection. So the thought is, so the thought is to when you build out the infrastructure portion of the intersection to build it raised, not to do like a Correct. Uh, a, yeah. a base pavement with mini ramps or something like that until the point at which you fully raise the rest of it. No, the intention would be to build it raised from okay. the get-go. Okay. Um, 
Other questions about capacity. I know there were some comments. Um, I really thought uh, a lot of the um, a lot of the points raised by the peer review, the traffic peer reviewer in this one um, raised a lot of really good points. I thought, and and one in particular about the capacity of this intersection. Um, and Drew, you touched on it a little bit in your presentation, but um, I'm I'm wondering first of all if you you know, you talked about the option down the road for potential widening here of multiple lane approaches at that point. Is there anything on any situation that you can envision whereby this intersection would require signalization or meet signal warrants? Or would you would you do a multi-lane approach with an always stop kind of thing? So, and kind of a Tough question. And I know you don't know any of those answers. <laughs> yeah, and and Erica is online too. I can help me out, but I'll kind of walk you through. So, like I mentioned, we didn't provide a full traffic analysis, which can be provided in the next one. What our thought process behind that, and what we worked with the peer reviewer on developing, is full build out trip generation, trip distribution through this intersection that we think is the absolute max this intersection will ever see. Um, a lot of assumptions went into that, but we started there and looked at a single lane always stop intersection. And then we kind of tweaked it and said, okay, let's look at some of the queuing. We don't necessarily care too much about the level of service, but we looked at the queuing and said, we wanna make sure this is safe. We don't wanna back up into other intersections and worked from there into, all right, if we ever see these volumes, which are projected beyond 15 plus years, we have the opportunity to add a left and right turn or a left and through if you're coming on Downs Road. Um, so with it being an always stop, we would anticipate that we'd never see more than just a left and right at a market street and leave it as an always stop in that scenario. If traffic patterns change, uses change in the future, and we needed to add a left turn onto, let's say, the Downs Road North approach, we would get rid of the always stop. It would be just a T, it would be just a market street stop and that would be free flowing. So kind of going back, we don't anticipate ever seeing that we're going to meet signal warrant analysis um, that's still in review and we're still kind of developing and fine-tuning that um, but we're not anticipating that which is why we've started here okay um i just i'm always looking out for the versions of us you know 20 years from now 40 years from now whatever it is and i'm sure that 20 years ago or 40 years ago people sitting in these seats were saying similar things about a lot of other intersections that we have in town. We can't predict the future. Um, but this, this just strikes me as, as being limited in terms of capacity. And without getting into it, I'll, I'll look forward to more information on that um, as you come forward with future um, submissions. Another question that I have, it's it's clear that you are um, intending to focus on pedestrian priority at this intersection, but it feels a little bit to me um, isolated. And so I'm curious if you have looked at um, repeating any of the same treatment at uh, adjacent intersections, particularly the one at Cross Street and Road to be named to the north. I don't know that we saw that one. Um, and or any either of the proposed mid block crossings on Market Street or further down on the Downs Road. And I mentioned that because I think that the I think that otherwise the geometry here continues to be um, you know encouraging of of vehicular through traffic and uh, and and higher than desired speeds. And so rather than coming out of the gates here with um, paint and signs and RFBs, which are sort of our classic um, mitigation tools, you know, after the fact, like when we have issues, because this is essentially a blank slate, it feels like the, there's the opportunity here to maybe um, try to design out some of those problems down the road. And so I'm wondering if you've looked at raised crossings in, in any of those locations uh, and or discuss them with um, with town staff. If you've discussed them and they're non-starters, then I'm, I'm the one that's behind here. But um, I think that that would be another 
way to sort of reinforce to people that are living and working on the downs, people that are visiting the downs, we mean it. We mean it that, that pedestrian traffic here is a priority. We're encouraging you to walk between lot three and lot two and where you live, um, you know, closer down to route one. Um, and we're doing that not just at this one intersection, but at a lot of other intersections. And I think that plays into, you know, you, you, you are doing that in other ways through the trail networks and things like that. Um, but I think with the roadway infrastructure, I, I'm, I'm just curious if there's the opportunity to sort of repeat any of that in a way to reinforce, really reinforce that um, kind of priority. That's my big comment on that one. Um, as for um, if you do stick with this, um, with this intersection uh, alignment, one of the things that jumped out at me immediately is that uh, you're proposing not only the, the radius intersection, but um, bollards at the head of Market Street. And um, the detail that you included for bollards, I think I only saw one, if there's a different one, my apologies. Um, but I think that this is a location that should receive really, really robust bollards given that geometry. Um, decorative if you want, but but crash rated at a minimum um, and in an effort to protect the uh, activity that you're hoping to attract on the backside of those. Um, what else? There were so many similar. Um, I'm curious about the uh, the heavy duty pavers. And I think that came up in some of the staff or peer review comments as well. Um, and so I'm not sure if you have additional information on those. Um, I'm curious what the maintenance would be like and whether or not we have any, do we have any of these elsewhere in town? Does anybody know? I, my towns get mixed up. So I don't think, um, I don't think we do, but sometimes there's a little learning curve there on, um, on maintenance, so I'm just curious, salt, sand, heaving, plowing, um, what the vision there is. Um, and the intersection plan that you have, C206, that shows long um, detectable warning panels here, which would be required for ADA compliance at a raised intersection like this. It looks like you're proposing um, what are you proposing on either side of those? It looks like uh, there are seat planters? walls. Seat walls, okay. And so the thought there is what, that those would coincide with uh, um, curb, as you introduce curb reveal? Yeah, and actually I probably could describe this in the presentation, but the, the seat walls are really more visual, but they're also to try to provide a safe pedestrian crossing so that people aren't crossing either at the ramp or further up. We wanna kind of force them and herd them to these crosswalks. Um, the seat walls are at their location. Um, the radii, which is the flush granite curb that goes around um, the corners there are designed for kind of the everyday traffic, but we've provided heavy duty pavers beyond that. And the seat walls are positioned beyond that so that the larger vehicles can still make the turn, but we're trying to condense the nature of the intersection so that the crossing seems smaller. So it's almost a, a guide, if you will. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there any, um, any, will there be any landscaping at this intersection? Yeah. Looks like a lot of hardscaping. Yep. I think between the tree wells on either side and the, and the, the landscaped areas that would ultimately, you know, possibly be in, in the temporary on this side, but in the permanent setting over here, as well as on the opposite and kind of the bookend side of the intersection are going to have some plantings and we'll make sure those are more clear in the application moving forward too for you. Okay, um, I think that's it. I have some other comments, but I'll wait for they're more detailed in nature. So I'll hold those for next time. Um, I, in particular, I'm just, I'm, I continue to have concerns about the long-term capacity of this intersection well beyond, um, you know, what we're looking at here. And I um, just wanna make sure that we are taking advantage, we collectively are taking advantage of the, um, the new design, the new construction here 
versus building ourselves things that will become maintenance or operational challenges later on. <laughs> um, but thank you for your uh, in-depth presentation. Um, also a second for um, always helpful to see the larger roadway network here. And I know that was a staff comment and Rick had the same comment. I just, um, the risk of being redundant, I think it's really important and it's really helpful for us, particularly when you're talking about um, you know, the fact that, uh, that you, you believe that a lot of the vehicular traffic will bypass this intersection. Uh, it's hard for uh, me, it's hard for me to picture that based on um, what was submitted, but I know that you have some more um, things coming. So be looking out for those, but thanks. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go to Roger. Um, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, when I first, um, saw this intersection in the raised, um, the four inch raised um, section, I thought it was pretty creative. And, um, and it, so while you have this screen up right there, the curved pavers, are they, are they gonna blend in with the, um, the pavers that create the four inch raise, rise or uh, are they gonna be a little bit higher? The pavers no, are also, are they going to be more defined, or are they going to blend in with the, with the you know with the contour of the um, the four inch raised pavers going leading up to the to the platform more or less. The intention is that I think the same material paver color scheme would would be throughout this intersection there as well as it's going to follow a certain grade based on how the raised intersection is is graded <laughs> out, but um, it's going to be all uniform. So, so that will not be raised at all. The, the curved section. Yes, it will be that. So, if you think of it, when you're usually on a sidewalk, you're a little bit above the road. We're just bringing yes, sure. the, the we're bringing the road up to that level, so that all those pavers you see will all be at the same grade with you know appropriate slopes. Okay, so for instance, if somebody were were in in a wheelchair or something, they would have no difficulty negotiating from the curved pavers onto the pavers that lead up to the platform. I, and I'm, referring, I'm, I'm referring to the platform as a, as a square center. Correct, that's all this relatively the same grade, yep. Okay. Um, okay, I, I, um, I, I still think it's pretty creative. It looks pretty good. Um, one of the things I read uh, in the materials was I, I think at the previous um, uh, meeting, there was some discussion around roundabouts and I just wanted to add this comment. I happen to be in this in a um, in an area. I'm down in Florida by Sarasota right now, and I happen to be in a uh, in a section which was all recently developed. It looked very much like what you guys are trying to do here. And um, their main street going through, they had three a series of three roundabouts uh, with mixed use buildings on either side. And um, when I first went through it, I thought, well, that's kind of a neat idea. But then the more I thought about it, I mean, it, the traffic going around the roundabouts almost um, overrides the pedestrian. I mean, if you're a pedestrian trying to get around those roundabouts, it's, it's, it can be challenging, you know? So I just wanted to add that, my two cents on that. Um, if you could, if you wouldn't mind, uh, Dan, going to your street network, that screen, <clears throat> sure. Okay. Uh, one of the things I was uh, I've been thinking is um, the the residents who live down by Route One in the um, the Mill Commons area, the first phase. Yeah. It seems to me when they if they want to head out towards the Turnpike or well, actually I wouldn't say the Mill Mills Common, but more the um, town residential north area. That's that's the one that's the one that's being developed right now, I believe, right? Yeah, that's on the screen upper right. Um, right. Yep. Okay. It seems to me when those people who live there want to get out towards the turnpike, they're going to go along the Downs Road and they're going to go to that intersection and then they're going to take Market Street. And unlike further north, where I see you have another road, you're kind of uh, sketched in there. Exactly. 
where people from, from the uh, innovation district, if they wanted to head south, they could actually come down the Downs Road, you know, and take that one of those side streets and, and get on the market right onto the parkway. Mm -hmm. So the, I, I can see a potential problem with the residents up there in the, uh, the town center north. They're, they're gonna use, they're gonna be going through that intersection. I don't, I don't see any other way. You don't have any other avenue for them to, to bypass that intersection other than um, uh, front runner mm -hmm. as a possibility and going all the way over and then connecting with that one of those streets to the uh, to the north of market. Yeah, correct. Yep. Um, and that's probably what they will do. But other, you know, other than that, they're, they're basically going to be stuck using that intersection. Um, yeah, and, and actually, yep. I mean, Drew mentioned it. We've been working on the traffic projections and the analysis. Um, yeah. And though there are a number of housing units, you know, from a number standpoint, that's the least traffic generation of the whole project, you know, that residential end. So um, we can provide the peer reviewer and the board more information on that. But out of the movements, that wasn't a particularly heavy movement. Um, if you compare it with, some of the other movements, especially more commercial movements. Um, but we'll get that for you, Roger, to, to look at. See, see, I don't see most residents who live in town, say east of uh, Route 1, if they want to get to um, Exit 42 or like that, I, I don't really see them driving through the downs. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think I would. I would just go down Route 1 and get on the parkway. And um, I, I don't see them doing it, but I can see especially as you build up more, um, you know, that you extend that front runner. And again, front runner, if you extend it, I can see, I can see the people bypassing that intersection completely, um, which would be a, probably a good thing. Um, and I hate to bring this up, but I just, I just kind of curious when you, when you were developing the town center, did you, did you give any thought to moving that town center green area up further east maybe a block and it just allow the downs road to be to continue to be a main road going through there do you know what i look at brian i mean we brian can elaborate but we really wanted the central square um okay to be right in the heart and to be an amenity that commercial a restaurant a retail wants to be across from and it's going to be more than a green, you know, the, and we'll bring a site plan before the board, you know, later this spring, but it's gonna have likely a brewery and other amenity space, lawn area. It's gonna be quasi commercial and really be the gathering place. So our design intent was to put it right in the heart, not kind of slide it out of the way. We want it to be that kind of magnet uh, for the project and, um, a little bit of congestion is frankly the a sign of a very successful city. I mean, so we're not trying to be free flowing at this intersection. We're trying to be kind of balanced and controlled. Um, but level of service isn't really the goal, you know, for moving cars through the intersection. Okay. What do you, uh, how, what, what about um, trucks? You know, if you're going to have uh, mixed use with uh, retail and restaurants and breweries sure. or whatever. Um, you're going to have trucks going through that same area. We are, and Drew mentioned sort of he has kind of showed what, how larger vehicles can make the turn, but the intention is that particularly the road, the roads you see kind of lower left from the intersection yeah. are intended to be for uh, more of the deliveries. Um, and those are also, those roads are kind of on the back of house side of the buildings that are gonna be fronting Downs Road. So you'd expect most deliveries would occur uh, using those roads. Um, but if a truck, it does go through these intersections or this intersection, um, I think the turning radius is designed to accommodate the, that fire truck, to accommodate trucks. Um, but the intention is to you know, direct them on a regular basis to the other roadways. Okay. Um, uh, my last question is um, on the intersection, the raised intersection. 
is that is there anything like that anywhere else around here around um, the greater Portland area or southern Maine? Because I don't recall ever seeing one. I think it's a good idea, but I I never I don't recall seeing one. There's well, I was actually in Burlington last this weekend. Um, and Burlington, 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 Vermont. Sorry, oh. That's not in <laughs> the immediate vicinity, but one of the a very successful um, street called Church Street, which yeah, people yeah. probably know about in Burlington, is a walking mall. It's yeah. an old street. They converted the whole street to a pedestrian mall. Yeah. But there are a number of cross streets, and those cross streets all come up to grade, and it's not that obvious, you know, because as you're driving, you, four inches isn't very much, six inches yeah. isn't very much, and those streets cross um the pedestrian mall so uh, that's an example that just comes to mind because i was there uh yesterday um but we'll give you a some other examples i know there's one in linfield mass there's there's some others that we can point you and the board to to kind of give you a better sense roger of of um real life examples yeah okay um well that's good um i think i think um uh jen's uh, suggestion on um, having raised intersections at those other streets, Cross Street and the other similar one, may be worth considering because they would they would create some more, you know, uh, traffic calming features. Um, but I um, I like the idea. I think it's pretty creative, and it's, I, hopefully it will work work out well. Um, I don't have any other further questions right now, Rachel. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Jim. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Following up on um, just looking at the main intersection real quick, when we're, uh, Jen was talking about Ballard, Ballard's earlier, um, maybe we'll look at the review state, review the standards for ATFP, that's anti terrorism and force protection for the build and construction of these ballers, because those tend to be more, uh, I guess, better designed to withstand impact of vehicles and things like that. Um, it's a much more prevalent uh, issue in today's world, unfortunately, but we definitely want to see um, uh, bollard protection for pedestrians, especially at that intersection, uh, and if that's going to be an open area in there. Mm -hmm. um, looking uh, more towards Roger's question, can you, because I'm, I'm thinking of uh, Commercial Street downtown, where uh, downtown Portland, where delivery trucks are parked in sort of the center median for yeah. deliveries and so on. Uh, can you include in your plan uh, to provide road signage to really physically you know, as best as possible direct these delivery trucks to take alternate routes rather than go through the downtown? Uh, that tends to be a, a little bit more efficient, uh, especially I'm just envisioning, you know, cars parked on either side, uh, a lot of pedestrians going around all over the place. Um, the turning radiuses may may certainly be there for how these large trucks to go across, but can't account for someone's poor taste in their parking. So um, having you know more directed signage for delivery vehicles to take alternate routes around and just avoiding that T intersection, or even adding another separate road that goes around uh, the entire area just for delivery vehicles, uh, just to avoid that is something that um, I would like to see at least addressed or considered or or commented on. Um, obviously not tonight, but uh, for the next presentation. Um, can we go back to the conceptual renders of the um, uh, the light commercial uh, feature piece? Um, the T intersection? This yeah. One? Yes, thank you. So do you, and, and this may be a little bit far ahead, but um, is the plan for those, for businesses at this intersection to really be sort of the anchor businesses for this location are they really gonna are they gonna be whatever businesses that go in there is it the intent for them to sort of help um, um, carry the image of this downtown vibe and feel for this intersection yeah absolutely okay and yeah I guess do you have I mean not to dig deep into this but do you have um, anticipations of what some of those businesses might be or interested parties already or we have a lot of interested parties that have actually been waiting on uh, the town center. Um, there's a laundry list actually. And so right now we're working on obviously building design and some initial pricing. So then we can start to work on, okay, does this lease rate work and does this space work? So we have a variety of restaurants that are interested in 
um, being within the project. Some are interested in, in this location. Some are actually interested in that the first lot off of Haggis Parkway, you know, near Allegash. We have some retail, we have some service that want to be in town center. So we've been designing the first mixed use building and actually this amenity building with those end users in mind. Um, and we're going to, you know, we're starting to kind of get reactions to our layout. We see this, this amenity building being really kind of a mix, you know, hopefully there's a, you can maybe make it out. It says brew pub, you know, a brewery restaurant on the right. Um, it would be an ideal spot for that activity. You see that covered pavilion, which is really kind of a, a place for a variety of things to happen. You can just hang out. There could be um, activities. There could be you know yoga in the park kind of thing that's happening under that covered uh, pavilion. And then the area on the left is potentially kind of amenity space um, for the whole project. Um, and then what this plan doesn't show very well is the surrounding kind of outdoor space that we're, um, this is really kind of zoomed in on the intersection. So you get a good sense of that building, which we want to anchor the intersection, but around it is going to have um, different outdoor amenities that would be, the, be for the project, also be for the entire community. So we're still, we're early. We're in the sausage making, as Brian would say, uh, stage, um, but we're getting pro close to kind of being able to bring it forward to the town. Great, thank you, Dan. Um, addition, uh, with regard to future growth in this area, um, and mimicking my colleagues' comments about wanting this, this centerpiece uh, intersection to really try to be as, I hate using the phrase, but future-proof or just planning for any sort of uh, uh, consideration in the future with regard to increase in traffic, population growth in the space. And, and I appreciate having the uh, uh, the, the foresight to sort of design this intersection with the um, thought in mind that it could be expanded in the future. Uh, and I'd like to see that kind of forward thinking, especially on something like this, which, you know, the next 40, 50, 60 years, people will still be using uh, this area. Mm -hmm. um, have you given any consideration? I know we talked about it briefly uh, at the previous, uh, at the sketch plan phase of this, but um, a multi story parking facility rather than having um, the sort of open parking lots? Has there been a consideration of having one close to this downtown area here? Um, again, thinking for the future, why not have something like that designed now, knowing that you know the, the, the geotech and the survey and the ground can hold such a structure or how large that could be in the future? And, maybe some uh, you know an architectural feature of that for people being on the roof to sort of get an aerial view of yeah. the entire downs um, i'm just seeing as this is becoming more popular you know you're going to, with with costco and allagash and other folks that have really expressed interest in here and also myself as well wanting to go here as well it's just going to be more and more popular as a destination so can have you considered a multi-story parking structure. And is that something that we could see as part of like a massing diagram on this and where would it we, be located? We've actually spent a lot of time talking about it. Um, and, but we also have a lot of, right now we have an availability of land and we have the kind of the need to make the numbers work for the, the initial phases of town center. So our current direction is to be very deliberate about kind of identifying a location where it's possible to kind of go vertical with parking. Um, and it could be that that parking starts as surface kind of as a lot of older downtowns have kind of the public lot, um, whereas it's like the overflow parking that's yeah. off street. Um, we're picturing something like that where initially it could be um, surface parking, but it's sized to your point, it's sized to kind of go vertical, it's in the right location within the town center for kind of ease of access, um, close to retail, but not in a key location that's, right. it shouldn't be. And also from a kind of a geotechnical and construction standpoint. So we know we can, you know, if the numbers work and there's the warrant for it, the yep. demand for it, uh, we could kind of execute on that. So that's been a lot of our conversation as we laid out kind of town center thinking about, okay, this is our, short-term plan mm -hmm. and this is kind of our long-term plan in terms of surface parking could we see that as far as even if it's just a, an area where you've considered that 
this would be where a multi-story parking structure would go that's near to this area. Because if you're, I'm, I'm thinking, you know, folks going here during lunch hour or something like mm -hmm. that for yoga, they want to go in and out real fast. Uh, they want to be in there. They have a very limited amount of time and window. Um, so I'd like to see what your thoughts would be on where it would go in there to help facilitate, you know, that person coming from another part of town or South Portland or Portland, yeah. going to an event here, meeting someone for lunch, being able to go park there, get out without having to worry about, you know, parking, you know, a quarter mile away or a tenth mile away somewhere else along that street, thinking, you know, this is going to be very busy, very popular and uh, very so. successful. Yeah, we can, we'll talk as a team and we'll generate some concepts for you to, to understand what we're thinking. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, uh, one comment I had on the lighting. Uh, I saw that uh, 3000 K color temperature for the LED fixtures um, based on the photometric plan. That's great. Um, as uh, just my, my thing, uh, just con continue to review. And as you see any kind of exterior uh, light fixtures have them specified at 3000 K, I believe that is part of the town standard for their ordinance, but um, 3000 K for building mounted fixtures and for pole mounted fixtures we want to see in there. Um, Cause nothing is, it's very obvious when you're driving through and you have different color temperatures and your light fixtures and it just doesn't quite look right. Um, Taking those through. Let's see, the only other question I have, the masking diagram for multi-level parking structure I'd like to see. Um, my last one, uh, because my Noah, my colleague Noah Perla is absent this evening, but speaking for him uh, and Grand Kevin, that it was a topic uh, when we approved the, um, uh, the right of way for the intersection on Route 1. Mm -hmm. um, you've confirmed that the grass seed and plantings, they all conform to state of Maine DEP list that they don't, we're not, we don't have any species on the plants now that uh, the DEP has flagged as an invasive or a do not plant. Recall that conversation. That's been our intention. We'll go through it again before the next submission. Great. Yeah, because I know I, he'll certainly be here for this next one and we don't want to, we certainly want to see that addressed. And understanding that some of these may have already been planted already in earlier stages. Um, if so, then that it is what it is at this point, but going forward, we certainly want to make sure that uh, nothing's being planted that is on that do not plant list by the DEP. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, my last question, Madam Chair. Um, for uh, Brian from uh, Cube3, uh, if we can go to the um, drawing that shows the multi-level housing and its proximity to the downtown spot. It was the uh, multi-unit housing. One of the earlier slides, I believe. Oh, is it just plan view? Yeah, it's just a plan view. Okay. I think it's one of these. Uh, my question is, um, this one? yeah, that, that's perfect. Thank you. Um, again, thinking about downtown Portland and how a lot of the older buildings there have been converted into residential uh, and with their existing restaurants and bars and a lot of music, the a live music scene and activity there has been a lot of issues about noise complaints and, um, you know, toxic curfews and things like that. Is that a concern that we should have here looking at the three I homes and the multi family units that close to the downtown space there, considering that you know we want to have pubs and breweries and and you know just a high 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 area motion uh, going on down there and not to say that this is something like rock row where you know we're going to be having you know massive live concerts but thinking more of what's going on in downtown Portland where a lot of people are complaining that well the bar is too loud yeah. downstairs yeah I I think it's a great question actually and something that uh, we we are thinking about quite a bit the solution really lies in the construction of the buildings and how they're put together I think when you're you're dealing you know we Working around the country, you see this everywhere, right? You see the repositioning efforts and uses change. And, and I mean, our office is in an old mill building. And, you know, so you have windows that don't comply with anything. You're missing insulation. Sound kind of gets in everywhere. Um, and I think that's true of Portland. I mean, it's a lot of, there's a lot of older buildings. There's some newer buildings. Uh, I, I think what we should do to make sure that we're not going to have that issue is just really take a look at the construction type of these buildings as they're evolving. I think... Uh, one thing that will make a difference, um, energy codes where they are now are driving construction to be tighter 
than it ever has been in the past. And that's kind of a natural noise mitigation approach as well. So I, I don't really see it being a problem. We haven't seen it as a problem where you're dealing with all new construction, like we're dealing with all new road networks. You typically see that where you have older cities that are really evolving into these exciting and vibrant places and you have old structures that don't meet codes or that have single pane glass or, you know, brick with no insulation. So right. I think it's a great concern. I think it's something we should pay attention to in the documentation of the buildings that are happening here. But, but I think, I, I think it will be mitigated just by the fact that it's new, but I, th I think it's something we should pay attention to. Yeah, so. and understanding uh, construction means and methods is yeah. something that's handled separately when 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 those all those all go to plan um, in construction, but maybe a consideration of um, more greenery, trees, bushes, yeah. kind of demarcating the spaces between some of the residential and the commercial that could help as well as just absorbing I some of the sound. Totally agree, hundred okay. percent. And and I think we're planning. You know, Dan had alluded to it a little bit. the The whole lot three space in the middle is going to be a fairly rich mixture of hard and softscape. And by having residential around the edges, but an absorber in the middle, I think will really help kind of manage that a little bit. And and frankly, it was one of the considerations to answer an earlier comment about Downs Road just being this kind of through street. I think when you do that, you not only increase potential traffic speeds, but you also get a lot more sound bouncing back and forth between buildings. So I think having a softer space and a more flexible space adjacent to a real strong retail edge, I think we'll start to manage some of that. So great. I guess as it be as with the next um, with the next iteration, if we could see uh, just kind of noted more focused areas and just calling that out just so that we could see it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, awesome. for sure. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, thanks. Now, Rocky made a good point that probably didn't cover to Brian's point on this plan in, in enough detail, kind of how we've arranged town center. So with Brian's assistance really to the to the south gym, kind of away from um, kind of the heart of this intersection is the multifamily. So we're, we're having that be on the south side closest to town center residential. Right. Um, 3i home, and I know they're gonna do their presentation they actually have on the first floor some kind of non-residential space closest to our mixed use building. So this is the mixed use building that you'll see soon. And then this pavilion that we've alluded to kind of could be a brewery. And then across the street um, is another mixed use building on the first floor being kind of commercial restaurants. So we've tried to, in addition to building construction kind of cluster like uses yep. um, while having some richness and kind of being mixed, but having the um, ground floor commercials be near each other um, and better neighbors for, and then kind of focusing the true residential kind of more to the South. So, but we can get into more detail at the next round. So you understand Definitely. that those methods. Yeah. And I, I appreciate that. I mean, for certain demographic, that is an ideal location to want to be living with all the sounds included. Um, but then another demographic, maybe not. And, right. you know, seeing anything that could go in there again, looking at downtown Portland, but I, I appreciate your answers. Thank you very much. And I guess the, the key phrase on this one would be uh, more noted softscapes. Thank you. I'm all set, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, and it is my turn. Uh, Dan, I, in terms of the parking, uh, parking lot or parking structure, you might want to take a look at the Westbrook proposal along the main street. I don't know uh, if how far it's got, gotten. And I know they had some problems sourcing steel when, when the price of steel went up, but they had proposed for funding uh, a parking garage with senior housing, affordable senior housing and open space area on the top of it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and it was tied up to um, a hydroponic garden along the side of it. Yeah. So that's a something to take a look at. I don't know what stage it's in, um, but it, it looked pretty impressive and pretty expensive. But um, that's uh, that goes to Jim's uh, question and idea about taking a look at, uh, there's, there's no reason why a parking garage can't be multi-purpose. So that would be something to look at. Um, I'm going to go back to Rick Meinking's uh, 
pretty much his first comment about the pumping station. And, you know, when the, the pumping stations are at the um, innovation district or they're to the rear of anything residential and they're kind of out of the way, that's, that's one thing you can't, you really can't see them or they're, they're blending into the appropriate area. This pumping station is right on Downs Road. So I would like to take a look at understanding that it's being built now. I would like to take a look at what you've got there, the landscaping uh, and any fencing. Um, because all of a sudden we have a pumping station that's kind of the introduction to the center of the town. So I, I, I think it would be important for us to uh, take a look at it and provide whatever suggestions and advice we can uh, on how to, how to screen that or how to make it more of a welcoming, uh, welcoming view to people coming in. Um, when will market be connected all the way to Hygus? So this subdivision plan approves the ability to connect um, Downs, Downs Road to where Market hands off from Hygus Parkway. So it'll be part of this phase one. I, and, and the reason I have a concern about that is, is we originally discussed this whole master plan. At some point, uh, Route 1 was going to be, the Route 1 entrance was going to be essentially residential that's was going to be taking more people into the residential area and the concept that was presented was basically that um, more people would be coming in directly from Hygis or down from Payne uh, visitors uh, mm -hmm. trucks things like that so it yeah. becomes it becomes important as you're building along uh, the Downs Road and into this town center area, becomes important to relieve any any uh, traffic, as much traffic as you can from the Route 1 residential entrance. So uh, it's good to know that you're going to be connecting that pretty fast. And will that then be the major area, a major route for construction traffic? Yeah, it's going to be, it certainly won't be the Route 1 end. So we think it's a combination of market, but also up to Payne Road. Um, and moving well away from kind of the Route 1 residential area of the project. Okay, very good. Uh, what else have I got? Yeah, you talked about Lot 4. Um, that encompasses the grandstand. I, and it seemed to me from one of your slides that you're going to be working in that area this spring and summer. When is the grandstand going down? Before we are working in that area, um, you know, we're working right now on um, selecting a contractor to kind of remove those structures. So we anticipate it's going to be, um, you know, in the late spring, I think at this point, um, early summer. And so both the grandstand and then the clubhouse would be removed before a lot, the entirety of lot four can be developed. Okay. Um, I've got a concern about parking and it's going to bleed over into the presentation from 3i. Uh, and it was mentioned in the memo from the, the staff. At some point, I have a real concern that we're going to double promise on street parking. That uh, it's easy to say, well, we'll add uh, 10 more spaces with on street parking. Mm -hmm. So I now have a concern as we get into the town center that we are creating a situation of on-street parking where visitors will not be welcome or where people who live in the 3i building um, won't be able to actually have on-street parking and they'll be looking to go elsewhere because somebody will want to come in and go to the restaurant. So I would like to see a scorecard of on-street parking. And that was mentioned in the staff memo. Mm -hmm. uh, they might not have used the term scorecard, but we've talked about it before. If not the last meeting, then the prior meeting, I think I mentioned 
the need for now to start really keeping track of on-street parking before we as a board start saying, yes, it's fine for those 10 spots to be counted as part of your parking allotment uh, when, when indeed it might not be fine. Sure, we can do that. Happy okay. Um, I also seem to recall from the master plan that there was a road off of Market Street as you head towards Downs Road uh, on the right that circled in back of what is now 3i in that corner building that contained a larger parking area that was going to be accessible and I don't see that on this plan. We we're not planning a road there. Um, we're planning interconnected driveways, one for 3i that would connect to the mixed use building. Obviously you don't this evening have the mixed use building kind of site plan to see that connection. Um, but that, that would be how access would occur to the parking behind both 3i and then the mixed use building. Um, and nothing would exit onto the Downs Road? No, there would, they would connect to, this might be the best graphic to show you. So if you can see it here, this um, intersection location driveway um, would, would be that driveway. You know, that would connect into parking behind the mixed use building. You don't have the benefit of obviously seeing the mixed use building, but it's roughly where the box is for lot one. And then 3i, you, you see their tentatively planned driveway here. Um, that would be the access to, to 3i. And maybe their, their sketch plan would do a better job of showing it, obviously. All right, could um, you show me again where, where the driveway see for 3i? This, See that cross, you, the cross hatching, it's right here. If you can see the cursor, let me go to a better. So, so, so there's a, an entrance and an exit to the parking lot, one on Market Street and one on Scarborough Downs Road? Yes. Yep. This shows it a little bit better. Um, but if I go to, so Rachel. What, uh, what's to prevent people from using that, uh, saying, oh, look, parking over there uh on their way in and using that for parking to go to the restaurant um, or to go and, to the town center the amenities building signage and design of where the parking is and and, and access to it um we can work further on that with the board on through site plan for the mixed use building um, but that our intention on the mixed use building, not to get into site planning details, but to have parking closest to Market Street and being separate for retail restaurant parking in addition to on street and then having parking that's more behind the building, which would be assigned and signed. If you're a resident, you'd have a number and you would say resident parking only um, is how we intend to address it, but we can review those details with the board. I, I think you need to, because um, if the on-street parking is going to be limited, basically are available for visitors and extremely limited, uh, people are going to, people are going to say that's a parking space uh, and they're going to be using that and they're going to be taking spaces away from residents uh, and spaces away from uh, the business on, on the corner. Um, you can put up all the signs you want uh, and people looking for a parking space that kind of, kind of ignore them. They're going to look at it as a, a giant parking lot, unless there's some sort of enforcement or, um, gate or barrier, some sort of barrier. I, the, the other reason uh, to be very careful about the on-street parking, uh, is deliveries. If you have a residential area a building, you're going to have um, FedEx coming by. You're going to have deliveries made. You're going to have DoorDash. You're going to have uh, a lot of activities of people going into the buildings. And if they don't have spaces to park in the front, those trucks are going to try and find places to park again in the rear. Uh, and then try to figure out how to get into the buildings from there. So I, I still have some reservations around the traffic flow and how you're gonna be managing the, the parking in that area. So I, I am hopeful that you're gonna um, come up with some, some ideas about how that is managed. 
Um, yeah, and th three I the three I building will they have access all the way through? In other words, you 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 say that there's one one uh, driveway essentially for the three I. Uh, can they use the one on Market Street as well? The intention is to have them be interconnected. Yes, yeah, so far that's been the intention. Yeah. Okay. Without um, without some careful design, that's going to become a cut through for people who decide they're coming from Higus Parkway and they want to eliminate uh, the, the three-way stop at Market and, and Scarborough Downs. That that will become a cut through whether. It's supposed to be or not, it's human nature. Sooner or later, they would see a way to do that. I can see me doing that exactly. Uh, so I think that whole back area in terms of parking has to have some very careful consideration. Uh, agreed. Yeah, and I think that team's ready to present their approach to traffic calming and, and surface treatment back there. So um, those are great comments. I think they can begin to address those this evening. And that's why we decided to sequence this the way right. we did. So sequencing this, um, is there any other questions from the board? Are, we, are, you, are you comfortable? Do you have any additional questions, Dan? No, I think, I think we're great. I uh, appreciate the time this evening and we're gonna work with staff on tuning up our submission for another round of preliminary. So I appreciate all the great comments and questions and we'll be back to you with some follow-up answers. And, and I also like the, the intersection as you've got it at uh, Market and, and the Downs. I think that's gonna be, um, it's visually, it looks good. It looks, it looks welcoming. And I think that's uh, been the design all the way along. Um, we just have to make sure that we're not encouraging people to zip through there. Yeah. So thank you. Great. Thank you. The next item is uh, Preservation of Affordable Housing LLC is requesting a sketch plan review of a four story 16,830 square foot housing facility for physically disabled persons. The project is located at the intersection of Scarborough Downs Road and the future Market Street assessors map R52 lot four for the, for the town. Eric. Thank you. <clears throat> So uh, Preservation of Affordable Housing, partnering with 3i, uh, is seeking a sketch plan review from the planning board of a 51 unit um, housing, uh, uh, multifamily housing for folks with uh, disabilities. Um, this would be split between 31 uh, one bedroom units, 16 two bedroom units, and four three bedroom units. Uh, this At this point, it's just a sketch plan to discuss the layout, building orientation, and possible site design for the project. Um, it would be followed by a formal site plan application, which would need to be reviewed by the planning board. Um, staff has provided a full site plan uh, review set of comments for ease of uh, site plan preparation for the applicant uh, with, with parking, net, residen net residential density calculations and design of the building needing additional detail uh, or review by the board come the full site plan. And with that, I would turn it back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you and for three I. Autumn, I can't share my screen just yet. I am. Oh, I've got it now. Good evening. <clears throat> my name is Paul Lynette. I'm the founder and president of 3i Housing of Maine. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, we established uh, our operations in 2020. I'm very pleased to be here this evening to open a discussion about our innovative supportive housing project, the first of its kind in Maine, that we believe will be an integral part of the Downs development. Our name is descriptive of our mission. As the materials presented to the board detail, 3i Home at the Downs is designed with the utmost attention to the environment 
<clears throat> our building is comprised of 51 individual apartments featuring universal design principles to promote independent living options for people with mobility impairments and physical disabilities. That's the first I in our name, independent living options. Through a federal grant we have been awarded, innovative assistive smart home technology will be tailored to our tenants. Innovative technology, that's the second I. It will enable our tenants to exercise autonomy throughout the building and in their individual units. Through our building features, which will include passive house principles, which our, um, our architect will uh, respond to later, and our programming, we believe that this project will set a standard so that people with disabilities can live within the community rather than be relegated to institutional placement. That's the third eye, an integrated home and community setting in a vibrant downtown area, close to work, recreation and socialization. The vision, the vision that I just summarized is the result of focus groups, feedback from potential residents, and most importantly, the lived experiences of people in Maine and elsewhere who understand the need for affordable, accessible housing. I wanna thank the board for your consideration. And as I turn it over to Corey Fellows, Vice President of Real Estate Development at our co-developer, Preservation of Affordable Housing, I do want to express 3i Homes gratitude to the Crossroads Group for their collaboration throughout this process and to the, to the design team that POA has brought with us here tonight. The fact that this dream team has come together around the 3i Home concept speaks volumes to their commitment to the project, one that will be a model to address a key social determinant of health accessible supportive housing for literally thousands of people in our state. I wanna thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. I'll be here if I can answer questions. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to Corey Fellows. Thanks, Paul, and thank you, board. Um, it's great to be here on the other side of the podium tonight. Uh, my name is Corey Fellows. I'm here tonight representing Preservation of Affordable Housing or POA, uh, we're a Boston-based national nonprofit that owns and manages over 13,000 units of affordable housing in 11 states. We're not yet in Maine, but we're excited about changing that soon. And um, I'm personally excited about that as a long-term Scarborough resident, the fact that this has all come together to this point. We've still got a long way to go, but we're excited to be at this stage. This is a big milestone for us. Um, I wanna briefly introduce our, our team. You know Drew from Goral Palmer. Uh, Gary Kane, our project architect from the architectural team out of Massachusetts. We also are working with a, with a Portland-based um, accessibility consultant as well. Um, and then I believe uh, online are Nick Acido from uh, Acido Landscape Architects, as well as my POA colleague, Vita Shklovsky, who's our senior project manager. And you'll probably be seeing and hearing from her in the future. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Drew so he can get into the plan and also happy to answer questions. Thank you. Thanks, Corey. Drew Gagnon with Goral Palmer. I'm going to walk um, the board through our proposed plan here today. That's the project team that Corey just introduced. This is kind of showing context relative to the master plan that was actually in front of you at the last agenda meeting. Um, so you can see Scarborough Downs Road cutting through the middle of the page here in Market Street, um, creating that lot one that we were just looking at. Um, this is that anticipated location of that mixed use building that we we're also talking about. And, and then the highlighted um, with the with the colors here are is the three I home site. I'm just putting this back on the engineering drawings that we were just looking at for a little bit more context. The raised intersection that had some discussion was up here. So you can see the context and um, three I home project looking right at cross street. Um, regarding the access that we were also just talking about we're proposing an access off Scarborough Downs Road right at the southern portion, so plan right portion of the lot. Um, and then working with the Crossroads development team will be providing secondary access um, down along Market Street. So this would be off site, but it would be an inter interconnected driveways. So the development program, and Paul touched on these, we have 51 apartments. Um, the breakdown's right here on the screen, 100% affordable, 
100% accessible and 100% independent living for this proposed development. Some of the design parameters, and this is a zoomed in version of the site plan here that we really wanted to convey to the board here, um, was completely accessible design of this parking lot. So as you can see, we have an abundance of ADA parking between van um, and standard ADA parking as well as some additional um, standard spaces located on the plan south. So um, we've really taken a careful attention to the accessible nature of this development. And some of these highlight our flush granite curb Wooner style um, drop off area and parking lot along the back side here. So this would all be at grade. Um, we'll have appropriate slopes, but essentially the one big um, ADA ramp, if you will, right across the front of this parking here. Um, there's some, some raised planter islands located along here to break up the parking in this area. Um, and then some nice paver treatments and material changes as you're working through the site here. So you can see that with the different brick looking hatch, um, those are anticipated, anticipated to be pavers um, and utilize as also crosswalks throughout the, throughout the site here. We're proposing a 22 foot drive aisle on the Southern part of the, of the site as long, as well as a 24 foot drive aisle kind of on the plan South portion. Um, so we'll be requesting a waiver as the staff memo um, noted from 25 feet to 24 and 22 on this side, we provided the extra two feet clearance within the parking spaces here to still give that 42 foot section that we've been holding. The main entry of the building and Gary came from the, the architectural team will get into this, but is located on the northern side of the building facing Scarborough Downs Road, providing some outdoor placemaking area here. We're going to detail this out during the site plan application, but we provided a nice space here to engage with the street. Utilities and drainage wise, we have just typical utility connections coming from Scarborough Downs Road and we're planning these and incorporating them into the subdivision design as well. So uh, fire, domestic water services, underground three phase power, sanitary sewer, as well as natural gas connections near the anticipated service entry of the building, which is on the plan south side. So um, jumping back up to the first page here, we have a few um, standard parking spaces with a small drive aisle for small deliveries and, and just kind of the, the service area, if you will, of the site. Drainage wise, there's a main trunk line that will that cuts through the site and goes on to the planned gravel wetland down on the south of the site. Um, so we're anticipating using that for some of our drainage collection as well as a few other basins. Um, and all the runoff will be tributary to that gravel wetland. So there will be none on site for as far as stormwater treatment facilities. Um, getting into the parking, we're proposing 41 total on-site parking spaces between van accessible, standard ADA, and parallel parking. Um, standard spaces are along the south side of the building. So again, jumping back up here, these are the ones I'm talking about. So we understand this is, um, we're, re we're requesting less parking than the multifamily standard um, from the town of Scarborough. And really this is based on what um, the, the applicant feels that the development of the program actually needs. So we're in a really unique situation where this is a completely accessible parking, uh, accessible building. And we really feel that 41 total on-site parking spaces are what this development is going to need. And, and in order to justify some of this, we, we found a similar development in the, kind of on the outskirts of Boston, as you will. Um, that's 0.6 spaces per unit. And this project on-site provides 0.8 spaces per unit. Uh, if you include the on-street parking in the immediate um, vicinity of the project, we're near closer to 1.4 spaces per unit. So in our application package, we provided 33 spaces that are directly adjacent to the site. We're not requesting or um, trying to allocate those spaces specifically for this development. Again, the 41 on-site parking spaces um, we feel are adequate for the site and for this use. So they were just intended to show that there's additional spaces for visitors or additional abundance of spaces around the site, but we do feel that the 41 on site are adequate for this use. This is another conceptual rendering of the site here. Um, and I'm gonna let Gary Kane talk about this one a little bit more. Good evening, folks. Gary, Gary Kane with the architectural team. Um, uh, we've done a lot of work uh, with Corey's team over the years, and we're very, um, very excited to work on this project. Um, accessible housing is very near and dear to myself, as well as 
Uh, so you've heard from other mem members of the team. So it's an exciting project. And um, really Dan and Rocky have put together a very thoughtful um, master plan. And we're really excited to work um, on the first building that's gonna be you know, right around the town center. Um, actually, if I could just back up, back up to the, to the master plan. I guess you could see my, my um, you could see the cursor. So uh, there's just a couple of ideas um, in looking at the building. You know, taking, you know, taking the master plan that Brian's team has put together. This was just a, a large volume, a block. Um, we haven't departed from that that general master plan, but this we're adding. You know, we're adding real dimension and texture to to that block. We have a couple of ideas. One of the things. As I looked at the master plan in the town center, I thought that there was a there was a real interesting uh, asymmetry, almost almost symmetry, but subtle asymmetry um, across um, a, a around about Market Street and the center um, of the town center. And as you notice um, on the street that borders the left side, uh, you know there's there's no cross street. It is a T intersection. But the buildings are are separated, and you've got a sort of a different condition. And on Cross Street, uh, again, you have a T-shaped intersection, and you know you're basically hitting the blunt face of, this, of the building. So uh, that's an interesting asymmetry, and I think it adds for a little um, uh, real unique or an interest around around the center that you're not just treating every corner, you know, um, very much the same. So we thought that that was um, uh, just an interesting. Uh, piece of the design. So we just put together, you know, just two, two basic ideas or a few basic ideas. Um, the common space is primarily a residential building on the ground floor um, on, you know, plan left sort of plan West around this corner between besides having a uh, downs road entrance, um, all of our sort of common space and public space is located, you know, plan left. Um, we also are, have a um, main entrance off of our driveway side. So uh, this is the sort of the active side of the project. You know, I could say that I could say that plan right is the service side, but this is a residential building. You don't have a tremendous amount of service. We've got a little bit of, we basically have got maintenance entrance and sort of we've got a trash, um, uh, we've got a trash activity that has to happen at this, this um, you know, southeastern portion. But I think the idea was to focus the real public, um, public activity uh, along the, um, uh, north, you know, facing the town center. Um, as you look at this, this plan, um, the building, the program, I think we're fully at sort of the volume and shape. Um, we're at a fully like a, a schematic design level. Um, this landscape plan is still conceptual. I think the, um, what we're showing you for the sort of the layout of the roadway and the patterns is, is advanced. Um, when we do make our next submission, um, uh, the landscape will be more developed. T uh, take just take the green with a grain of salt, or the tree, any kind of tree locations. But this is basically the space that we have around the building to work with, and it'll be much more much more developed as we continue. Um, as I mentioned, we have uh, our public. Uh, excuse me, our active our active parts of the program is plan left, and. Um, uh, as we were talking about uh, just the parking, how the parking is going to function, um, with this building being 100% accessible, um, you know, we, we would have loved to have had an underground parking garage um, for uh, for residents. Um, this is, I think, this is a hybrid approach. I think what we wanted to do is we wanted to create at least a covered uh, covered access from uh, from the drop off area, you know, into the building on uh, on the parking lot side, and so. So the common areas are basically designed so that we can we can enter off of downs or enter off of the parking, um, any kind of um, uh, package deliveries or drop offs can also happen uh, along uh, the driveway, uh, as Drew was mentioning the sort of the flush curb condition um, along the south side south side of the building. The we have taken. The overall design, I'd say that the exterior envelope, this is still sort of conceptual. This is really was the first, um, uh, we presented it to the team for the first time uh, um, a week or two weeks ago. Um, of just a couple of simple ideas. We basically have just looked at the exterior of the building. We tried to design it with um, 
sort of two textures. The, ma the materials are primarily gonna be a fiber cement panel, a uh, combination of panels and lap siding. And we've kind of designed that with sort of just two different sort of colored textures, a sort of darkish texture and a light texture, um, sort of just lacing them and uh, just providing some variety around the building. And then we've got um, some masonry, some you know, sort of a uh, white color that sort of is signifying the main entrances and the public areas around the building. So just a couple of different materials to sort of break up the facades and sort of uh, show what the program is. Um, additionally, along this, this sort of axis, which is coming from Cross Street, um, you know, we wanted to create a, you know, a series of bays, our living room bays. We've got five, a series of five bays that come, that sort of, um, sort of ends the vista looking down Cross Street. And uh, at the base of them, um, since this is a, a, you know, it's a fully residential building, we've designed these to sort of look like um, direct, direct level entrances off of the sidewalk. Um, they're gonna be sort of like a front stoop. Um, all of the apartments are entered off, are, you know, uh, are accessed off of an internal corridor, but we're just building a front stoop, um, hopefully with like a raised bed, something for the residents to be able to use a raised flower bed uh, and just some, some personal space there, but something to activate activate this facade so that we don't just have a, a wall of windows and uh, we're trying to just uh, add a little bit of activity as you're entering, coming down, downs, coming into, into the town center. Um, on the parking lot side, uh, just a similar treatment. We just, you know, we're, we're using some use of some color just to sort of signify some of the public spaces, public spaces of the building. Floors two, three, and four are all um, are all uh, residential spaces. Uh, re excuse me, residential use within the building. Um, a few of the comments that were made earlier relative to um, noise and overall construction. Um, you know, we're showing we're showing solar panels. We're we're hoping to do a passive house building. You know, high performing high performing envelope, uh, energy efficient systems. Um, uh, you know. All of that does lend itself, uh, just as Brian was pointing out earlier, uh, between you know, high-performing windows, whether it's triple pane, triple pane glazing, um, very uh, very tight envelope, and exterior walls that are much thicker and much more insulated than uh, a lot of you know a lot of construction um, uh, that we've uh, everything you know all of the codes are just sort of lead, leading there, but um, we're we're budgeting those right now. Everything is not. Not finalized, but that's what we're uh, that's what, what um, that's what we're we're hoping to be able to achieve. And uh, lastly, is just a small again. These are conceptual, just a rendering looking from the town center towards the main entrance and the common areas, which are all on the, the lower right side. And um, and again, we want to just sort of re, uh, develop uh, the landscape and the, that sort of ground treatment that's happening all around the building. Develop that a little bit for. Um, to another level before we submit for the uh, next time we're here. Thank you. Yeah. Closing. Yeah. I do want to go back just one real quick. And um, one of the points I forgot to discuss before I hand it over to Gary is kind of furthering our discussion on the cut through and how this site is designed. So. Um, we've, we've really paid special attention to detail for trying to create an access aisle that doesn't feel like it's something that if you're on Downs Road, you want to get to Market Street, right? So we know that there's going to be a connection kind of plan west and south of this site to Market Street, but we don't want that to be the public roadway for a cut through. So, you know, we've come up with some some tighter radiuses than we'd probably normally do in a parking lot, but also still while trying to accommodate emergency vehicles. Um, part of that is also the 22 foot drive aisle when you enter. So it feels small. It doesn't feel as wide as the road you're coming in on. So it feels like it's not meant to be a place for someone to turn left and to, and to go and cut through. Um, in addition to that, I mean, we have material changes along the crosswalk, which are gonna just feel like you're in more of a residential setting. Um, and then Gary talked about it briefly, but we're evaluating whether there's a covered drop off in this location. And really, we want to actually bring that covered drop off as far into the access aisle as we can, whether it's cantilevered. So without any um, type of columns or anything prohibiting that, but that would kind of really give a better sense of this feels like a residential, this feels like a private setting, not necessarily just something for 
um, you know, the general public to just use and cut through. So another key to this is we haven't developed the full landscaping plan, which Nick Casito from ALA is going to do. He's going to do a great job on trying to create visual cues so that it feels like from a structural point of view, you're not entering a right away, right? We're entering a private space. So I did want to just touch on that. Um, and then going back to just closing here. Um, so the applicant and the development and the pro, uh, the development's intent is site plan in the next couple of months uh, following concurrently with the subdivision schedule that was just in front of you. Um, the goal is to obtain approval ahead of the July 2023 Main State Housing Authority application that was mentioned previously. So that's a big deal for funding for the development. Um, and that's that's our goal for, for moving forward. So um, I'm gonna turn it back to the board and we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. This is an item that is available for public comment, but we typically take a break at 8.30. So before we start the public comment, uh, there will be a five minute break uh, from whatever time that clock says.
We will now reconvene uh, and reconvene to the notice that town hall is closed tomorrow. Uh, this is an item that is available for public comment. I will open it to public comment at this point. Is there anybody in the room who would like to comment? Is there anyone online? Hearing none, public comment is closed. Turn this to the uh, over to the board. Let's start down at this end with Jim Hebert. Sure, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I have a couple questions um, with regard to the units, the living units in the house. Are they single person or multi person? And forgive me, could you tell me your name again, sir, please? Gary Kane. Gary, thank you, Gary. I apologize. No, quite all right. Um, we have, uh, I think it was mentioned, we've got 51 apartments. And um, here, let me just pull out the breakdown. Um, we've got 31 one bedroom apartments, 16 two bedrooms, and four three bedroom units. So there will be, there will be multiple, you know, there, you will have. Uh, you will have some multiple uh, occupied units, but the pr uh, predominantly more than 50% are one bedrooms. Great. I'm glad to hear about the, uh, the, the tight building envelope, the triple pane windows, um, building that into your budget as you you're picking up on our earlier comments for uh, uh, on the previous uh, agenda item. Sound will be a, a real consideration here, um, especially for um, uh, the folks that are going to be living in this in, in this building. So, if we can maximize the uh, amount of green space, a green sort of sound wall protection against um, uh, just against this uh, facility, softscapes as much of it to absorb the sound as possible, because you know folks may have um, um, an issue or or, uh, or sensitivity to a high amount of sound, light, things like that, just depending on what their, what their impairment uh, might be. Um, I'm very happy to see a, a facility like this here. Uh, we just wanna make sure that, um, that it's also sort of protected as well from the other, uh, you know, the, the traffic going through in the space. In the outdoor, speaking of that, in the outdoor placemaking area, uh, similar to my comments uh, earlier, I'd love to see um, just to, uh, either um, somehow not disguised, but certainly present um, strong crash ballards to protect against pa uh, pedestrians uh, from any vehicles that may go off the road, slide, slip, or for whatever reason, uh, just sort of protection. If that's going to be a large gathering space for, for pedestrians and folks outside, we want to make sure that, that those are certainly protected from uh, errant vehicles. My, my big concern here, um, is the parking uh, if if with a with a fifty one unit building with only forty one on site parking spaces, it's it's not even one vehicle per room. And I understand that some folks there may not be able to drive a vehicle and, and will have to have some other arrangements. Um, but I, I don't see um, I don't see like a bus stop here or a bus drop off. So I'm thinking from the perspective of someone who's there and they don't have a vehicle, um, how are they going to go and like carry, you know, go to go to the grocery store or or do their, you know, normal day to day things that may involve them leaving, leaving their home and going elsewhere, whether it's getting groceries, doing any kind of shopping, traveling somewhere. Um, is it just going to be Uber and Lyft and taxis coming and going through the space or is there going to be like a, um, like uh, any coordination, and maybe this is more of a town question, but coordination like Greater Portland Metro for a bus route through here. And maybe that's already been discussed before I was uh, a member of the board. Um, and if it has, forgive me. Um, but I would like to see some kind of uh, route or solution for public transportation in here. Because uh, if already, if, if we're, and, and Madam Chair, you mentioned this as well when we're talking about. Um, uh, Drew, you had mentioned a combination of using on-street parking as supplementing uh, parking spots for this building as well. It's, it's starting to raise some red flags as far as capacity just in the entire area, especially if you have it this close to the downtown space. Excuse me. It's this close to the downtown space, and already we're looking at you know, 10, 15 years from now, those on-street parking spots are going to go away if there's a lot more traffic. 
Um, we need to make sure that we have adequate parking for uh, the residents who live here, the workers and the employees um, that are working here. Um, and that's just a big concern that I have. So again, maybe that's a, leads in again, previous comments on the other application about multi-story parking facility, just to make sure that we have adequate parking for everybody here. Uh, Cause there is nothing worse than um, living in a location and going to a spot where you theoretically have it for yourself and then not having it. Uh, I lived on the East end in Portland for a while. So I know that feeling very well. Um, so I would like to see what, and maybe this is more um, in, in your court drew as far as what what uh, GP is able to do with regard to, um, you know, how are we going to address this parking issue elsewhere? And, and you know, taking a look at this multi-story parking facility closer, I guess, what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, and I, I think, you know, I understand the concern, which is why we wanted to point to a, a similar development. Cause again, the unique nature of this development, not having been in Maine or I believe New Hampshire before that, um, we're kind of cutting edge here, if you will. And we, we're, we're studying other sites to, to really develop. Well, what do we, what do we think we need? We're not proposing a reduction and telling everyone that they can't have a car here, right? It's just really what we feel like it's actually going to demand at this site. Um, regarding the public transportation, I know, you know, the overall subdivision has been working on um, bus stops, whether it's, I think it's going to be around this intersection and, and then, and then getting the Metro to try to get in here eventually at some point. So that's all in the works. Um, you know, I don't think we have any commitments as of tonight or anything like that, but that's certainly something that we're reviewing and that, you know, is certainly, we're hoping that this project helps generate the Metro to come into the project. Right. So we're hoping a kind of a combination of all that. Uh, and then again, on the on-street parking, I'm not, we're not going to reserve any of these spaces, obviously, in a public street and a public right away like that for this law. It's intended for visitor. It's intended for that kind of shared parking of all the other different uses around it. So we really start with 41 units we feel is adequate for this development and then the surrounding infrastructure being able to support visitors or the really high demand peak times in conjunction with all the other sites as well. So gotcha. No, no, I appreciate that, Drew. And again, my only concern is you have you know, a resident here who can't park their vehicle in one of these in one of these marked spaces because they are all taken and now they have to sort of search around the downs to go and park somewhere else for it. And especially if they're somehow physically impaired where, you know, walking a significant distance is a real issue. Um, I, I see that as a, um, a, a real big concern for me, just making sure that they have access 100% a guarantee if they have a vehicle at this building, they should have a dedicated parking spot here, whether and whether that's a sign that's taken care of through 3i or whoever the the the, the, the landlord or, or management of this facility is, maybe that's more on them for the to decide, but um and maybe other board members can chime on this as well and, and finish this thought for me. But and, and with all due respect, I, I, I do understand the comparison we're, we're making here for you know, other, other areas like this, but we, we aren't, not yet anyways, the outskirts of Boston. I mean, that's, you know, we're talking about over you know, a million people densely populated down in that space with multiple choices of, of adequate, I'll say adequate uh, public transportation, where, you know, whether it's trains or buses or just a high density of Uber and Lyft that's in that area. We don't really have that. Uh, where we are in Scarborough for this. So making sure that, um, you know, uh, the John Smith in this building is able to go outside on their stoop and they know that they can go and sit at a bus stop and that bus is going to come by every hour or something like that. And they know they can get dropped off there. Or if they know if they can take their car, they can have a spot to go back on. Um, so again, sorry to harp on the parking issue. I'll, I'll get off my box now, but that's... Uh, not a question, but just a consideration that we really want to want, really want to focus on, not just for here, but for everything with regard to the downs as we keep going. And Madam Chair, I am all set for right now. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Roger. Okay, thank you. Um, actually, I, I, I have some questions on, along the same line. I, I'm inclined to um, defer to um, the developers on a project like this because they i like to think that they know their um their clientele and and their residents and and their needs and everything um 
maybe I can preface my question by asking the, the residents who will be living in this facility. Oh, first of all, I, I just wanna say, I think this is a great facility. I think it's a great concept and I'm really pleased that it's going in right here uh, in Scarborough and right at the Downs. Um, do the, uh, the people who uh, are gonna be living here, do they have to qualify to a certain level of disability? Um, Corey Fellows from POA again. Um, we're gonna be working that out with Maine State Housing as well as other funding uh, authorities. There typically are uh, tenant selection plans that are required um, and you have to abide by applicable fair housing laws, obviously. Um, based on our discussions with Maine State Housing to this point, um, we're confident that, that we will be able to develop a, a set of criteria for determining eligibility based on physical disabilities. That hasn't been fleshed out yet. Um, I also just take this opportunity to say that, you know, to Roger's point, um, you know, we, we have been doing a lot, of, a lot of work with focus groups. We've had listening sessions. Paul, um, with his group 3I, before, long before Poe ever got involved, had done a lot, a lot of legwork um, uh, with different parts of this population and sort of uh, determining what, what the needs and preferences were in terms of living space and parking and so forth. Um, so that, that really was a big part of what informed um, how, how we developed this plan. And we'll continue to flesh that out. We're also certainly open to continuing to coordinate with, with Crossroads on, on, on parking solutions, among other things. And as, as Paul indicated in his intro earlier, it's been a great coll collaborative process to this point. Um, and also finally, uh, just take the opportunity to say as well that um, this property will be professionally managed by POA Communities, which is our affiliated property management company. Um, so uh, POA, POA Communities is, has a lot of experience with, among other things, um, uh, enforcing parking regulations and, um, you know, in, including in some, in some tricky uh, contexts with a lot of different competing uses and demands. Um, and then we also have a, uh, what we call a community impact program, which is essentially resident services, uh, where we partner with a lot of local organizations. And I say that partly because that I believe will be part of the transportation, the overall kind of holistic transportation solution here. In addition to public transportation, we realize that we're not quite at the critical mass where we can do truly transit oriented development here, but that's, you know, that's sort of aspirational, but we're hoping that we will will be part of getting to that point. Um, and then we anticipate that we'll be partnering with local organizations, medical organizations and others on shuttles and things like that to take people to appointments um, and, and other things. So by no means will that solve the, the parking challenge on its own, but it'll be part of that solution. Thanks. Uh, Corey, why are you still there? Um, yes. Will, will, um, will individuals who are not disabled be able to live in these units uh, should they, like say um, a, a child of a, an adult child of a, an, an adult, you know, a mother or father who's disabled, would they be able to live in a facility such as this? Yes, that's a good question. And that's, we, we fully anticipate that will be the case. Okay. It, it will not be the situation where everyone in a household has to have a physical disability to be able to live there. Okay. Um, can, can I just jump in? Because it's, it's uh, this is Paul Lynette. Um, one of the unique features, really, of, of this from the get-go is to keep families together. And sure. what, ha what, ha what can happen is, and it has happened, where people become disabled and families have to be, have to, uh, be separated and broken up because there simply aren't enough accessible housing units. And so we're not gonna solve it, that problem with the 51, but we are going to make a statement that rather than an institutional bias, which does exist in our society, we can include people in, in the community. And that includes families of, of whatever nature, uh, including the one that you just uh, posited, Roger. Right. A uh, question for Drew, I guess. Um, the on-street parking, is that going to be dedicated parking spots for this facility? Or could anybody who's um, going to the town center 
use those spaces if they were going to be if they were going to be available. The on street parking on Scarborough Downs Road, so plan north is not dedicated to the development at all. Um, okay. It's for public use completely. Everything on site will be dedicated for uh, the residents. Okay, okay. Um, I, th I think this kind of lends itself to the overall concern that we have about the general parking in the whole area. And, um, and um, I just, as you and Dan have mentioned, um, you're gonna be taking a, a closer look at that whole, that whole situation uh, because I just, you know, I just wonder about the, um, the parking spaces available on this site. Um, I mean, what if they, if they had visitors coming, you know, and, and things like that. I mean, that, that's my, that's my only, my concern about that. Um, the staff made a comment in, in their, um, one of their comments was about putting in some sort of a, um, a condition so people could not bypass the intersection that we talked about previously. And, and make a shortcut through the back of this facility and then down onto Market Street. So I think that's an important um, a important thing to consider. And um, lastly, my, my last question is um, on the um, first floor, if I recall reading correctly, there was, was, there, was there plans to have some commercial activities on the first floor? And if so, was that all the first floor or just a portion closest to the town center? Hi, uh, Gary Kane from the architectural team. Um, there's no commercial uses in the building, but what we have is on the, you know, on the Western side, um, you know, probably a little less than a third of the footprint of the ground floor uh, is basically our common, our common, um, okay, common, okay. common and amenity areas. Uh, okay. there, uh, but there are, um, there are eight, uh, nine, nine apart, you know, nine other apartments uh, on the ground level um, beyond that. Sure. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, I don't think I have any further questions right now, uh, Rachel, but um, this, this is, uh, I, I think the architectural drawing, at least the, um, the preliminary one is um, very interesting and um, it adds a lot of uh, vibrancy to that area. So, um, Looking forward to further discussions about this. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Jen. Um, okay. I uh, I also share the concern. Actually, I'm kind of struggling with this because I share the concern that this will, in some way, by default, become a. I don't want to use bypass. I'll say alternate route for people between uh, Downs Road and Market Street for a number of reasons, many of which we have already discussed either on this um, project or the one prior. Uh, however, that said, we you know we talked about the advantages of that in the prior project. So. Um, I'm just conflicted on that. <laughs> like I can, it's it's going to be a challenge for the operations of this building. But I think from the for the from the the network overall, you know, the less traffic that you can feed through that key intersection, um, vehicular traffic, I should say, the better off that will be. So um, I don't envy, <laughs> I don't envy you there. Um, I am curious about. Um, the choice to site the um, accessible parking away from the building. And am, am I correct in assuming that that's because you anticipate more pick up and drop off activity closer to the building um, and less perhaps turnover parking, I guess, for lack of a better term, um, among the accessible spaces that would presumably be for, um, for residents. And this, this catches my eye because it's, it's sort of atypical, right? Like a, like a traditional uh, apartment building would have the accessible spaces as close to the, the accessible entrance as possible. And actually in a number of ways, you, that's the opposite here. Um, there's quite a few of them, but you know, even, the, even the short bay of parking, for example, at the end, which is also very close to an entrance, doesn't have accessible parking at them. And so I'm just curious, that was, 
intentional or if that was done uh, purely based on the number of, of um, accessible spaces that are warranted here or, or sort of what the vision is for the operations of that parking lot. Yeah, and that's a great point, Jen. So just to clarify, the the hatched on, I'll call it on dry vial parking spaces that are parallel to the building are also ADA. So they're not striped like that, but they have the flush curb condition and they have the drop off and loading area next to it. So to a degree, we have almost everything on the plant south side of the building as ADA parking. So okay. it might be a little misleading with just the striping shown. Um, but yes, and then to your point, we also do anticipate, you know, a high activity, a higher activity of turnover closer to the drop off area, which was, you know, we wanted to provide that area to pull in and leave without backing up um, and kind of a more typical drop off fashion. So that that kind of played into it. But um, I hope that helped a little bit on the, the siting. Of sure. That. Yeah, mostly just a question. I mean, it makes sense that you would have a lot of this type of parking here. Um, I'm, I'm really curious, don't need an answer at this meeting, but perhaps a future meeting about whether the team from 3i consulted on or what your thoughts are on the intersection design that was just presented um, very specifically from an uh, lowercase a accessibility standpoint. So is this an intersection that in your opinion, knowing your um, the population that you represent and that is likely to live in this facility, is that a design that is uh, friendly and um, usable uh, for them? So that's just something to think about. I think it's uh, someone used the term universal design, which I just really love. And there's a lot of literature out there about you know, uh, capital ADA is a federal requirement. All of these projects have to comply with that. But, um, you know, frankly, it's good for all of us, right? Like everyone gets a little older or you have a stroller or, or you're wheeling a delivery in. Um, and so I, I always think of it from, from that context, but, but very specifically from people. Uh, and you, you represent this. That's how, I, that's how I see this. You represent this population. Um, in a way that we will not know. <laughs> and so I'm curious, um, you know, and you, you can work among your teams in that way, but if you have anything to offer to that design, anything that, that perhaps we have overlooked or the rest of the team has overlooked, I think that would be really um, wonderful input uh, for making it better for all of us and for your residents. Um, The, uh, just for a question of clarity, um, Drew, you said, I believe you said that based on the development's experience, the, uh, the amount of desired parking that's, that's been um, determined to be needed for this facility is accommodated on site. Is that right? Correct. Yep. That's what within the 41. Okay. And so anything, anything utilization of anything offsite or in addition to that would just would be in addition, not necessarily based on our ordinance, but based on the experience of the, um, the project. Correct. Um, am I correct in understanding that there will be no direct access? No direct access to the sidewalk facility on Downs Road from individual units? Correct. And we actually um, talked about that quite a bit internally with the team. And again, sketch plan level, we're still working through everything here, but the intention is to have some sort of buffer there. Yes. Okay. And so um, I, I once lived in a long linear building like this, and I have no mobility challenges, and I had a fronting a unit that fronted out on where I wanted to go. And I always had to go like all the way down and out around another building. Um, so I kind of feel this a little bit, but um, I, there are some advantages I'm sure of doing it this way that you can sort of more securely um, control access in and out. Uh, but I just think that I was happy to hear the input about um, sort of the, uh, the, the integration and activation of the, the downs facade of this building with the sidewalk frontage. I, I, I like that it's sited close 
um, and that you're you're looking to plant and um, and otherwise you know have that space be activated by residents um, I think will will be uh, just will elevate the use here and also be consistent with a lot of the other um, visions that we've heard about for this this portion of the project overall. Um, I really appreciated uh, the prior comment about transit and there is quite a lengthy background on that one um, for the, the downs overall. I think like as, as was stated, I think this is a terrific, um, you know, inch in that direction. Like if, if a project like this doesn't really help encourage transit to come onto the downs, then goodness, I am not sure what, um, you know, what would. And I would hope that with continued dense development at this intersection and, and in the town center overall, that we can continue to sort of inch in that direction. Um, <clears throat> I do have a question actually for staff. Um, so we've decided that or determined that um, on street parking isn't um, dedicated to this uh, building or any other of the buildings here that it's sort of for public use. And I can't remember if on any other projects we have seen this or if this is to come later or not to come at all. Um, is it regulated in any way? Like, is there, is it time restricted any of the on street parking here or it's just as long as you want for however long you want? Uh, I haven't seen anything that has a time restricted. It's just open on street parking. Okay. Um, this popped into my mind when we were talking about um, deliveries or other sort of parking needs on site that are not um, not accessible, maybe. So maybe it's a home therapy, someone that's coming to give therapy or a cleaning person. I'm not really sure, you know, someone that's, that's not, that's coming to visit a person here that doesn't necessarily have a hang tag allowing them to park in any of these spaces. The options for them then would really only be these seven spaces at the end. Is that right? Or on, or on street. Correct. Yeah. Or on street. Yep. Okay. And, um, Again, I'm going to put my trust in your team and and uh, assume or correct me if I'm wrong that that is sufficient for a building of this size. Yeah, and again, we're going to provide more justification in our site plan application intent tonight was to introduce it, but yeah, based on our research and again, we'll keep digging into it, but okay. that is adequate. The other option that I wondered, and this is my last question, um, is whether or not there's the opportunity. So. I'm not actually sure. I'm looking at the same plan, I guess, um, which I don't think shows. Does this show the lot line? It does. It's um, and I see like the, part of a lot line. It's it's over here, and then it carries through because of it's shown as gray because okay. it's part of the subdivision. Um, but real quick, so you really you really maxed out on this site. Correct. Now this lot line isn't fixed yet. We're still working with Crossroads and the development team on exactly where that line where that sets, but it's somewhere in likely in this location. Okay, so that answers my question. I was going to see if there's any room on site to bank parking, should you need it in the future? And the answer to that obviously would be no. <laughs> um, but you know, given the, the location of this building in proximity to the other things that we know are coming online, including this big box that you've labeled future parking, um, I think it would be great if there was you know, an opportunity, the management may be tricky, but um, the opportunity to, to rely on uh, some shared some shared parking. So for example, if there's an office use or, or some sort of compatible um, use nearby where the demand is, is, is an off time for what may be needed here. Um, and that's not specific to this particular site, but in, in general, um, as we sort of move into the heart of this um, project. That's all that I have. And I, uh, I really appreciate this. Um, project and I look forward to seeing the rest of it um, through design. Thank you, Jen. Rick? Yes, uh, thanks for bringing this to Scarborough. I, I think this is something that's um, certainly, uh, there's a need for it. Um, my understanding, your involvement with Maine State Housing, um, they do require you to do, uh, you know, a better than code building you do have to do 
some sort of, uh, and, and you alluded to the passive house, which I think is a great, you know, you're going from the code requirement of three ACH to 0.6. So you're, you're going to have a fantastic envelope. You're going to have great windows, probably triple glaze. Um, and so to, to my colleagues comment about noise, I think, I, I think there's some inherent construction um, methods here that will help uh, keep it quiet in there. Um, I'm reminded of the hotel that went up on 4th Street. Um, East Brown Cow, I believe, built that. And a year later, they had to go and redo the entire outside because they got tired of issuing earplugs for those that faced 4th Street because of the noise coming from the bars and stuff like that. So it is an issue. And as we move into a downtown district, it will certainly be of, of um, this board's uh, concern that we minimize um, the noise within inside the buildings. Um, I'm assuming because you're saying this is independent living, there is no there is no state licensing requirements or anything like that. You're not going for any license. Yes. So yes. then um, to to Jen's point, um, I see where there's probably going to be um, services brought to folks living there. Um, you can't escape that. Um, my experience, you know, 10 years in a long-term care facility, I recognize that um, there's a lot. You On a holiday, you have every uh, buddy picking up mom and dad to go and take them to, to their house for Christmas dinner. Uh, you're going to get traffic. I am worried about the traffic. I'm, and, and, and so I'm just going to ask this question. Why did you choose a four-story building instead of a six-story building when you're you're allowed to build something um, six feet, six stories in this area and not four stories. Um, building up can be a little cheaper. Uh, it has challenges, um, especially if you're talking about an elevator, whether you're gonna do a, a bore or you're doing a cable and things of those nature. But I'm just throwing it out there that there could be a way in which we could get more uh, on-site parking uh, by adjusting the footprint of the building, maybe going up, uh, maybe the middle goes up and you can shrink in the sides a little bit and allow for more internal uh, lot space that would allow for some uh, additional parking. Um, I, I'm just concerned. And, you know, 22 aisle drive width. I know there's some pros and cons, less impervious, but now you have tighter uh, distance between cars coming and going. And uh, I'm not sure how I feel about, you know, the waiver request of reducing uh, drive aisle when we're not even getting the, you know, in my opinion, um, enough uh, ancillary, I'll call it ancillary parking, because I think that's going to be the drawback here is, is the services being brought to uh, these folks um, shouldn't be minimized. It's going to be traffic. And, and, and so I have some concerns with that. And I just would like to see if maybe you could address it with, a, with the footprint of the building itself and uh, maybe resolving some of those issues. Um, I uh, applaud, and I, I'm assuming because I'm reading into some of the the pictures here, but I'm thinking you're going to VR, uh, variable refrigerant flow system, all heat pumps, uh, tying in with an electrical system that you probably don't have enough roof space. Certainly if you go up, you're gonna maybe shrink the building, you'd lose a little bit of, of uh, roof coverage for the PV. So you're not gonna be a total net zero building. Uh, and, and I don't think that's your intent, is it? To go net zero? You're, you're just doing some on-site generation to uh, be responsible stewards. That is correct. At the moment, we're, we are not net zero. And, and that even at the moment right now, our, we're, we're hoping for passive. We're hoping for solar PV. All, it's all in budgeting at this, at this point, but um, yeah. that's where we're, that's where well, we're again, you got, you got main state housing. You have to follow their rules too. And, and they've got some, quite some stringent. construction requirements if you're going to, to utilize some of their their uh, assets. Um, 
on that same note with the VR, with I'm, I'm guessing VRFs, and you've got a couple of uh, uh, penthouses up there. I don't know if that's for the, the elevator machinery or what have you, but um, I'd kind of like to see the detail of the, um, the edges of the roof. And is there an opportunity to build those up a little bit higher just to do a little bit of screening? Not that I want to, me personally, I love to see pol uh, solar. And I love to see VRFs, but I'm a geek. And not everybody likes to see those big steel boxes, knowing that they are uh, got a COP of, of 3.2 when it's minus five degrees out, uh, real good energy savers. Um, so I would, I, I'd like to see if maybe your design team could take a look at the facade and see if maybe there's a way to uh, do a little extra shielding as, as it's downtown and you're gonna have other buildings and some people just don't like to look at mechanical equipment on roofs all the time. Um, but I think, you know, generally speaking, I, I think my other colleagues have uh, certainly addressed a lot of things here. So my big takeaways uh, or my big ask for you is, is, is maybe looking at um, the footprint of the building and see if there might be um, a way in which we could uh, get the parking uh, situation a little bit better than what it is. Um, and also uh, check the newly um, approved uh, EV ordinance that the town of Scarborough has. Um, we're pretty aggressive about that in this town. That's all, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to try and wrap this up because my colleagues have done a wonderful job. Um, I, it, is that they've been talking, I've been going through my notes and crossing off things. Uh, I, and, but I do want to um, indicate and let you folks know that I'm, I'm with my colleagues that, that this is a wonderful project for the town. And I look forward to it uh, coming back to us in, in more detail. A uh, couple of things. One, I'm going to use a term that Corey Fellows must be uh, terribly familiar with, and that's talking about robust landscaping. Uh, so as you are looking at the landscaping, I'm going to be looking at how robust it is. That includes how you're going to handle the outer doors, um, the, the doors to the, the outside from the apartments, those little, uh, those little patio areas. There are other buildings in the downs that have that sort of an arrangement, and I'm not saying copy them, uh, but you might want to take a look at how other people have uh, other developers have handled that. And I'm thinking of the uplands and a couple of the uh, apartments or the condos, I guess, along, uh, along Downs Road. Um, that's an opportunity for landscaping that's both um, pleasing to the people in the apartments and a wonderful visual for the street. Uh, I echo what the staff have talked about, the, back uh, the bike racks out there. Um, I don't know if you're planning on having bike racks inside, uh, a bike room inside, that's something to, to consider. Uh, that's happening in one of the other developments in town. Um, that place also has indoor trash receptacles. I don't know how, I don't know if you're expecting people to take their trash outside uh, or if there's some going to be some sort of an indoor a facility where they can take at least their at least their recycle certainly that's something to take a look at um i my druthers is that you you really do not count the on-street parking at all as you're making any calculations so uh, according to our uh, ordinances that require your building requires 87 um, off-site parking spaces or off-street off off street parking spaces. I, and you've got, I think, 44 that I counted. There may be more. Uh, I'm just not convinced that that is adequate. So um, as all of my colleagues have mentioned a problem with that, uh, I'm going to add my voice to that. Uh, because you also have, as you're looking at it uh, from the staff memo, lots with 40 or more spaces require 15% of the parking lot be landscaped. So the full site plan that comes before us has got to have that sort of, uh, that sort of a 
landscape or come to us for a waiver. Um, you need to, you, you are gonna need to do that. I suspect lots with 15 or more spaces shall be broken up with trees, landscaped islands, grade changes, low walls and other features. They still need to be accessible. So that sort of a design needs to be extremely careful. Uh, as I look at the access and the, the what I will no longer call a cut through because I will try not to cut through there. Uh, it, it seems to me that one possibility, um, if you're really looking at a 22 foot uh, drive aisle is to make that all one way. Uh, as it exists now, um, it's very, very narrow. And you might want to really, as I said, strongly consider looking upon that as a, as, as a one-way drive aisle. That uh, also means that folks will be less inclined to cut through if they can only go one way. You have the parking spaces, um, parallel parking along the building. Folks who come in the wrong way, the wrong way onto that drive aisle are going to have to turn around to park in those parallel spaces. Uh, a Making that whole of one way actually takes care of that. So I, I think you need really to, to think so carefully about how this parking is gonna work, uh, knowing that we don't wanna give residents a hunting license for to get a spot. That they should have enough space in their own facility and their own next to their own homes that they, they don't have to go out on the street. They don't have to wander through uh, across the street into other parking areas. Um, but all of this really, all of the parking really needs to be related to the building and interconnected. So I, I look forward to how you're going to think about that. Uh, there are a few other mentions here um, in the staff memo that I'm sure you'll take a look at uh, the continuous internal walkways, uh, space making or place, place making. Uh, and I look forward very much to your coming back to us. And I think we will, I think we will be able to uh, get this done for you, uh, especially if you work carefully with the staff uh, and follow through with their advice. I think the timeline that you have uh, presented to us, I think that's that's doable, uh, especially with your careful work with, with the staff. So thank you very much. Good, thank you. We now have uh, the Opeachy uh, Construction Company uh, with a proposed hotel. And that is item 4.02, Opeachy Construction Corporation requests a sketch plan review of a 113 room hotel located at 205 Southborough Drive. The property is further identified as assessor's map R37, lot 48E. I am going to combine this discussion with item number 502, Opeachy Construction Corporation requests a site pl a plan review for a temporary gravel stockpile at 200 Southborough Drive. The property is further identified as Assessor's Map R37, Lot 48E. So we will start with the discussion of the sketch plan. Uh, once we are satisfied with the discussion with the sketch plan, we will simply move into the discussion of the gravel uh, stockpile. Uh, Eric? Uh, just to uh, give a brief uh, update, I know the hour is sort of getting a little late. Um, the At the February 21st planning board meeting, the board requested that the applicant provide a sketch plan for the proposed development um, that was considered uh, as a site plan for a preload in that area uh, at 205 Southboro Drive. Um, the applicant has provided that, uh, showing the overall layout, parking, and grading. Uh, the site plan for the stockpile um, uh, we're reviewing jointly here, as Rachel just mentioned. 
Um, staff's primary comments revolved around confirming that the building height would meet the 60 foot uh, mac maximum height for the B2 zoning district. Um, but we've also included full site plan review comments for uh, ease of full site plan submission uh, by the applicant. Um, on the site plan side of things, uh, the staff has provided a draft motion for the board's consideration if it's comfortable with the sketch plan at this point and similarly comfortable with the uh, preload stockpile application. And with that, I would turn it back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, and for the developer. Uh, thank you. Uh, before we get going, am I able to share my screen, Autumn? Thank you. And, and by the way, for those of you who are new to the planning board, uh, Eric did make a comment that it's getting late. Um, we have gone, uh, to 11.30 and 12 o'clock. Um, I suspect that we will not break those records today. We'll That's do everything we can thing. to not. <laughs> All right. All right, that's working now. All right. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you, Planning Board. Uh, my name's David Sherborn. I'm an architect and vice president at OPG Construction. Uh, we're a design build contractor located in the Lakes region of New Hampshire. Uh, we have designed and built over 50 hotels throughout New England. Um, over the last couple of decades. Um, I'm here with Maureen McGlone, uh, civil engineer from Ransom Consulting. Um, we're representing 49, uh, 491 Payne LLC, who's the landowner and developer for this particular project. Uh, I'll, I'll keep it short. This is obviously the site plan. Um, we'll sort of run through sort of the basic programming of the hotel itself, uh, what we're looking to provide. And then I know that there was some staff comments, uh, a memo that was sent out on Friday, and we've sort of got some verbal responses to respond to those, and we'll open it up to some questioning as well. Uh, in terms of the basic uh, site layout and programming of the building, uh, you can see here on the site plan, uh, it's proposed as a four-story hotel, 113 rooms, uh, located on the southern edge of the property with the main uh, entrance for guests at the uh, northwest corner of the building itself. Um, the parking lot uh, connects into part of the existing parking lot of the Homewood Suites to the east of this particular property uh, project. Um, there is Sebago Brewing to the north and also to the north of the site is uh, Pizza Plus. Uh, that extension of the existing parking lot uh, runs south and then turns west where we've got um, a cul-de-sac uh, at the entry point to the uh, hotel. Uh, and we're also proposing a uh, utilizing the existing curb cut along Payne Road. Um, and the purposes of that would really be for the utilization of emergency vehicles only. It's not intended for um, guests of the hotel uh, entering and exiting the site. It's really just uh, use of emergency uh, vehicles. So um, as I just briefly stated um, it's an extended stay hotel it's an, an unbranded hotel so it's not affiliated with a hilton or a marriott uh, it's independent uh, four stories tall i can confirm one of the staff comments is relating to maximum height of the building we are at 44 feet which is below the 60 feet uh, permitted in this zoning district um, it's a 12,000 square foot building footprint uh, overall at 48,000 square feet uh, I will show you shortly in the floor plans, but guest amenities are somewhat limited compared to a lot of sort of branded hotels. There's a small sitting lounge, an outdoor patio, and a small fitness room. Beyond that, there is no food service for guests. There's no breakfasts or any other bar or any other amenities uh, beyond that. Um, there was a little bit of confusion. I can clarify that a little bit. We are proposing 137 new parking spaces to be built as part of this hotel project. Um, 114 are assigned to the hotel itself, uh, with 23 that will be leased to Sebago Brewery um, at completion of the project. Uh, going over, there was some, um, some comments in terms of bulk and massing. We can just confirm that 
Uh, obviously, the first few here are just frontages, which we're all compliant with. I will point out uh, maximum building coverage, 50%. Uh, uh, maximum, we're currently proposing 12%. Maximum lot coverage, 85%. Maximum permissible, we're currently proposing 55%. Building height again, we're under the 60 foot max. Uh, and we meet the buffers and obviously providing the um, 114 parking spaces, which is slightly more than one per room. In terms of where we are with the uh, project status, we started back in October uh, having a consultation with staff, um, Barry Stowe from our office and Mark Wagelman, one of the um, co-owners of the property, uh, met with staff. And based on that consultation, we then reached out to the fire department, uh, in particular looking at utilising the curb cut off Payne Road. Um, there was some feedback and some tweaks that were made to the site plan, which is where we are today. And... Um, the initial feedback from the fire department was pending town approval and planning board that they were uh, okay with the, the approach that we were taking there. Obviously, we were here last month, and this is part of that continuing in process that we're happy to work with the board and the staff to, to get this through to site plan uh, approval. And uh, in our anxiousness to expedite the process as much as possible, we did file for a full site plan uh, application earlier today or this afternoon. We understand that there's at risk and there's going to be feedback here that we may have to make some adjustments to that. So we're happy to answer any questions that come up from that. Uh, beyond through the town, we know we've got um, some main DEP um, modifications for the preload and the hotel that we have to make. Uh, we've reached out for a pre-application um, as part of that amendment to the site location. Um, and then there's obviously stormwater law as well. Um, I think, as you can probably tell, between last month and this month, we're trying to expedite the process as much as we can. The developed the um, property owners excited for this project and looking to start construction as soon as possible uh, this year. Uh, so here's the site plan. We talked briefly about it. I can move on to the floor plan. So this is our first floor plan right here. Um, the there's eight uh, structural bays on the left hand side, which is the uh, westernmost portion of the building facing um, Payne Road with the entrance of the cul-de-sac uh, and through here we've got a small reception area uh, adjacent to that is a small seating lounge uh, opposite that we've got a small fitness room and an elevator and stairs up to the upper floors at this western end of the building a small guest laundry and a small vending area the remainder of the rooms um, approximately 350 square feet. Uh, this being an extended stay is a, with it being an extended stay really means that there's a in-room uh, small kitchenette. So there's facilities for people to be able to cook and provide food rather than just be um, bedroom and, and bathroom. Moving up to the upper floor, we really see a continuation of the guest rooms in the same uh, manner as the first floor, but obviously on the le left-hand side, uh, what was sort of administration and public amenity space now becomes guest rooms, and that's applicable for floors two, three, and four. Uh, the next page is what we have envisioned currently for the exterior treatment of the building. Um, we've, we've included in these full site plan application earlier today a narrative, um, but uh, the direction we are currently going is would be sort of um, synthetic stucco for the majority of this and try to utilize that um, to articulate and provide some relief within the building through color um, and facade treatment. We have recesses at each of the stairwell exits on the northern and southern side of the building and also uh, have a projecting mass with a higher roof line and a larger roof overhangs and slightly different coloration um, at the northeast corner here um, to help draw attention and make it easily navigatable for people entering the site and guests to find their way to the main entrance of the building. Uh, another view similar just rotated slightly so this would be looking from Payne Road itself. Uh, um, similar treatment again just uh, utilizing the facade materials and the windows and the composition to to break up the, the mass of a, a building, uh, the hotel and uh, we got some site plan. This was part of the original site plan application. I think I'll, I'll address some of the, um, the staff comments and then if there's any specific questions, I think Maureen can answer relating to stormwater treatment, I think was part of the original um, preload application as well. So 
as I mentioned, we had staff comments come in on Friday. Um, I'll just sort of run through where we stand with some of those and how they may or may not have been addressed with the site plan application or what our um, approach to those would be. Um, item one was talking about space and bulk. I think we've uh, covered with those. We address those in the full site plan and everything's compliant from our perspective there. Um, plan development standards, there was a comment about, you know, providing amenities such as benches and bike racks to, to sort of help strengthen the walkable pedestrian amenities. Uh, we're more than happy to do that. Ownership's okay to do that. I'm not sure if it's on the current site plan application, but we're happy to add those. Um, and we um, should have no issue getting an approval from the condominium um, of 200 South or um, ownership team to, uh, for the proposed site plan as it stands today. Uh, one comment came up regarding pain road access. Um, staff is recommending to eliminate both curb cuts that exist today south of um, Pizza Plus. We are eliminating the southernmost curb cut. Um, I just want to remind that the northernmost curb cut, we're looking to utilize it as it is in terms of uh, location and width. And just remind you that uh, we hope the board would look favorably on utilizing that, knowing that it's only to be used as um, as emergency access vehicle and not for users of the hotel itself. Um, part of that access as well, I was talking about screening of any parking um, around that cul-de-sac. We're happy to provide that. And um, we've got a landscaping plan as part of that full site plan application. Another comment was relating to service areas and if there's any dedicated service areas to to be proposed and if there are, uh, there is any screening that's associated with that. We're not proposing any dedicated service areas. This is, um, there's limited sort of public amenity. There's not food service. So we're not expecting a lot of service deliveries. It would really be in the, um, the extent of cleaning and small vending supplies. Um, we have full truck access to the easternmost portion of the site uh, with turning radius that also fire apparatus and larger trucks would have access to. Um, uh, parking, uh, we were able to clarify the 114 spaces. Uh, I can confirm that EV spaces will be installed. Um, the required percentage of installed, ready and capable will be required as proposed, uh, as needed. And we've got that in the site plan application. Uh, there is dead end parking through the cul-de-sac that was identified. We can confirm that there is adequate space for vehicles to turn around. Um, and that it will be screened from Payne Road um, to meet the town standards. Um, we are providing 15% minimum landscaping. That will be clarified on the site plan application that we in today. Uh, and then in terms of outdoor seating, we currently show an outdoor seating area on the southern portion of the site um, uh, adjacent to the southern side of the fitness room and um, with the stairs coming off the elevator lobby in the stairwells to the south of that, um, the building. Uh, we will, we have provided lighting, landscape and stormwater plans. Um, there was a clarification that there was uh, six settlement plates for the preload uh, identified in the geotechnical report. Uh, we're happy to amend that. And I think we had shown five, but we can add six there. That's not a problem. Uh, we're currently going through the process of getting any, uh, necessary South Portland sanitary district approvals. Um, and we will provide, happy to provide erosion and sedimentation control uh, as requested by the staff. And uh, we, as mentioned earlier, we've begun the process of the amendment to the main DUP site uh, location permit. So that's kind of a quick run through. Hopefully you followed it all. I'm here, Maureen's here available as well. And we can pull up some plans uh, to address any comments or concerns. Thank you. Uh, this is an item that is subject to public comment. Is there anyone in the room who would like to comment? Seeing none from the room, do we have anyone online? We do not. Public comment is closed. I'm going to uh, throw this open to, to the board without calling on anybody by name. Uh, who would like to go? Thank you. <clears throat> um, thank you for the presentation uh, and seeing this uh, with the previous, uh, the loading um, application item as well makes it much more clear. So thank you for uh, being very clear on that. The only, um, the only comment that I have uh, in 
One is for you, is that for the LED lighting, whether it's building mounted or if it's pole mounted on the site that just confirm and make sure that they're specified at a 3000, 3000 Kelvin color temperature. No problem. Yeah, that's typically what we'll do on building and site lighting. So we'll confirm that that's Perfect. the way it was. Done. Yeah, a lot of times it can be 3,500 or 4,000, but really 3,000 is what we want here. It's more of the warm white. Agreed. Yeah, uh, we like that too. Closer to the traditional uh, lighting source. Uh, thank you. That's the only question I have for you. The other question I have is, um, Presuming um, no further questions or issues from the board, Madam Chair, are we moving forward with this? Were we voting on this draft motion afterwards? Uh, this is this is a, a sketch plan, so there is no vote. Right. This is related to the uh, preloading portion. Go ahead. Um, the the item three, the applicant will have six months to submit a site plan until May 1st, 2024 to receive building permits before the applicant will be required to return the site to pre-existing conditions. Is this our way of giving them a timeline for when they're allowed to keep that on there so that the preloading is not on for an overly long period of time? I believe that's correct. And I'm very satisfied with everything presented tonight. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, just piggyback on on the three thousand K. It's it's also the dark sky. That's the big thing. You can't get dark sky fixtures if they're greater than three thousand K. So you're on board with the three thousand. That's excellent. Um, it will require you to have the dimming capabilities so that during uh, you can schedule it to lower uh, output during less traffic times in other words like midnight yeah. you can turn it down a little bit and, and nope. save the planet oodles right not a problem um i too um am satisfied at this level you you kind of had an advantage because we kind of talked you through the sketch planning last time you were here because we were going through the the preloading i'm satisfied the direction you're going with this on the sketch plan i think having the staff um, comments here and your responses to to most of them seem like uh, you're all on the same page uh, i'm comfortable with that and therefore the conditions on the stockpiling uh, phase I'm, I'm comfortable with what was roger yelling at me well i roger has, has had his hand up so i'm waiting to to call on him when you're done oh okay well i am done all right. Thank Rick, you, Madam Chair. Rick Mine King is done. Roger. Roger, I think you've been unmuted. Okay, Roger, uh, Autumn's having trouble unmuting you. So I'm gonna go to, uh, okay, you're up. I'm, I'm actually, actually, I'm, I have no problem with anything that's been done, been said so far. I wasn't at the last meeting. So I think um, my colleagues have covered everything well. Um, so I really don't, don't have much to, to add, I don't think. So I appreciate your patience. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. Anybody else comments? Uh, I just have two questions. One, um, without going into too many of the details, it looks like in general, the idea, the approach to stormwater here is to um, use some, actually some pretty creative green infrastructure treatments, but to generally not um, tie into or drain to existing stormwater systems with the exception of the lower lower right. Do I have that right? Um, lower right drainage area. Yes and no. Um, let me try and see if I can do this on Dave's computer. I have, yeah, let's go with a. Yeah, that one. And, and I apologize for, you know, how quickly this was kind of thrown up there, but it was, we were in the midst of uh, trying to finalize calculations. This, um, this particular site um, was brought before the board with the Sebago, um, but it was brought before DEP with 
the Sebago piece as well as uh, a restaurant in the in the same area that we're currently working in. So when that design was done in 2008, it considered this development. Um, but what it didn't consider is that this development would be proposed 15 years later. And some of those stormwater treatment systems are not actually available anymore. Um, so that BioCell 2 that is just south of um, the Homewood Suites, that uh, BioCell was oversized and was intended to take uh, a certain volume of water um, from this particular site. Um, through our site plan um, changes here from the original uh, proposal, we're gonna be stealing a portion of bioretention cell two. And therefore we have reduced the amount of area that can be treated by biocell two. So we are reducing the amount of impervious surface that is going to biocell two. In doing so, we then had to find other treatment mechanisms for um, that parking lot. So we're using um, a focal point treatment um, also, it's a, it's a type of biocell. Um, it's just more, it's like on steroids. It, you can, uh, the soil filter media can, um, the water can go through it at about hundred inches per hour versus about 2.5. So it's um, pretty heavy duty uh, treatment system with a very small footprint. Um, the discharge from that treatment system will still go through the piping um, and out to the level spreaders as was previously intended um, for this entire area. We're using um, also some uh, focal point systems as well as another bio cell and grass under drain swales around the building and around the parking lot, uh, treating the water there and then interconnecting it with the storm water that goes out to those level spreaders instead of using a storm treat system, which um, I think don't even think you can get on eBay, um, but it uh, is not one that would be um, even available for us to be able to put that in. Um, so the fortunate thing is that some of the infrastructure is already in place. Um, all of the piping is already in place. And uh, for the most part uh, on some of the drain manholes as well as the, as well as the sewer manhole, uh, we have uh, pipes that were stubs that were installed and capped uh, during the, the construction of the, um, the Sebago Brewing. So we're planning on using that, uh, that um, existing infrastructure to be able to bring everything from stormwater down to the level spreaders and then from sewer, uh, there's a sewer manhole that, that currently connects out onto Southboro Drive. So that takes care of some of that, that infrastructure question. Okay, great. Um, and then did I hear correctly that you included um, turning template diagrams with your site plan? Is that what you were saying earlier? Today, that went in today? Uh, we didn't include any turning template diagrams. No. Okay. I know that they were done, but we didn't include any with the site plan. Application. Okay, I, maybe, maybe even as just part of um, a presentation next time, it would be yep. helpful. I'm just curious to see how that works with that. Um, yep, that makes an awful lot of sense. Circle there. That's all I have. Yeah, I think I think one of the things to consider with this particular hotel, because it's um, pretty uh, low key, I guess, uh, and I, we had the same questions about the, the trucks, what kind of trucks are you gonna be uh, bringing in through here? What kind of deliveries are gonna be made? My understanding is that they're, they're gonna be your standard box trucks with UPS deliveries, FedEx deliveries, um, you know, nothing, nothing big. Um, so that, that made me feel a little bit better about how we would be able to manage uh, getting that traffic in through there. That, that cul-de-sac is actually 31 and a half um, from the edge of the parking spaces to the center. Um, I keep calling it the Spartan and that that is like an ear. So it, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's 31 and a half feet from the end of the parking spaces to that center island. So that there's a, there's a pretty decent um, aisle in there. All right, thank you. Um, I'm going to actually probably move faster into the uh, gravel wetland, but I, uh, the gravel stockpile, excuse me, but I do have a couple of suggestions for you. And one is um, in terms of 
the uh, landscaping uh, on the parking lot in between uh, the, the Spartan and Payne Road. A lot of times um, what folks have done is put in a berm with uh, grasses on top of it uh, and low bushes and trees. Uh, that's something that you can consider or you can do a, a typical landscape, but in any case, you need to make as much effort as possible to hide the parking area. That's, uh, as I said, that's one way of taking a look at it. The other thing to talk to you about is how you get into, or how people know how to get into the hotel area from Southboro Drive. I, and what you are really going to have to do uh, is provide some wayfaring signs in the parking lots. Uh, so you're gonna have to talk to the Homewood Suites and, and Sebago again to make sure that you can put up some signs in there that say X hotel this way. Correct, yeah, and we've, we've talked with the ownership group. There's an existing pilot, uh, monument sign out on Payne Road that has space for one additional uh, sign in there. So we can start out on Payne Road and obviously um, they're amenable to us working with them for wayfinding signs uh, off Southborough Drive as well. Yeah, because what once they're in there, um, the the traffic lane right next to Sebago Brewery, uh, I have found from visiting there, uh, is kind of narrow, uh, and cars going both ways provide a, a problem. So direct direct folks into your parking lot. Um, very carefully, uh, one way past the Sebago and the other way past the Homewood. In other words, into uh, entrance on one drive aisle and exit on the other drive aisle, because you're going essentially sending them through parking lots. So just make sure that you're really clear uh, for them, uh, for your uh, guests, how they're going to get there. Um, I agree with the staff uh, on uh, the other comments that they may have on there. Um, I think you've responded to the questions that they had in general. Uh, moving into item number 5.02, the Peachy Construction Corporation request site plan, excuse me, that's not it, uh, for 4.02. I was right, 5.02, a Peachy Construction Corporation request site plan review for a temporary gravel stockpile at 200 Southboro Drive. The property is further identified as assessor's map R37, lot 48E. Notice how I slid from the sketch plan, which we seem to uh, have finished our discussion of, and into a discussion of the, um, the gravel uh, stockpile. The geotechnic report uh, indicated, uh, and I think this is something that's important for you in terms of what you're looking at in terms of starting construction, that without WIC drains as an eight month settlement, um, with WIC drains, there's a three to four month settlement. And if you folks wanna get into construction uh, in June, uh, you're gonna need to put the WIC drains into the into the gravel. Yes, and we've started looking at that as well. Yeah, uh, that that uh, could meet your desires uh, in terms of how you how you manage your construction. I like the design of the building. I look forward to seeing a little more of it. I was uh, intrigued by the windows that you showed in the front. Uh, they were a little different. Um, I think from what I saw, they were. Um, the the mullions were not uh, were asymmetrical. Correct. Uh, and I thought that really provided an interest in that building that kind of broke up again more of the more of the facade. But you don't have that asymmetrical uh, in the end. I don't believe the facing uh, pain road. No, there's narrow windows there, so it didn't really provide the opportunity to. Um, do that, but we are taking a, light, a slight look at that right now. We're looking at the room configuration, so there may be an opportunity to do something more like that on the Payne Road end and, and, and add some more interest similar to what we're doing on the, the other yeah. sides. We really appreciate, and, and actually the, the codes call for, the ordinances call for an interest 
uh, to a building uh, at the street, at the visual. And folks are gonna be going through there and really taking a look at, at the building. So that end unit, uh, the end um, facing Payne Road, uh, really look hard at that uh, and maybe a little beef up on, on what it's gonna look like. Okay, not a problem, we'll definitely do that. Okay, I, uh, I don't have any more comments. Do we have anything else? In that case, I have, uh, just in case you weren't aware, we, we did agree with your sketch plan all right. all um, right. with all of the rest <laughs> of the comments. We don't vote on, we don't vote on sketch plans. That was positive, so we'll take that and run yeah. with that. <laughs> You're in good shape. Uh, I have a draft motion, OPG Construction Corporation site plan review. I move to approve the project titled Temporary Gravel Stockpile proposed by OPG Construction Corporation as depicted on the plan set prepared by Ransom Consulting dated 2-27-23 with the following findings and conditions. Findings. The proposal includes placement of a temporary gravel stockpile at 205 Southboro Drive. The stockpile is in anticipation of a future project that will require further site plan review by the planning board. Conditions, one, prior to the start of construction, a pre-construction meeting is required. The meeting shall include, include appropriate town staff, the developer and their site contractor, and is to be coordinated through the planning department. All plan modifications are to be completed prior to scheduling the pre-construction meeting. Two, prior to the pre-construction meeting, the applicant shall a, provide a performance guarantee. The guarantee must include, but is not limited to, the expenses for the removal of the preload material, removal of all existing stockpiled materials, restoration of the site in, to existing conditions, stabilization of the site and any necessary erosion control measures. B, based on the geotechnical report to reduce preload time, revise materials and plan sets to include wick drains. C, address comments in the staff memo dated 313-23. Three, a site plan review by the planning board will be required for any proposed construction and use related to the stockpile and preload area. The applicant will have six months to submit a site plan and until May 1st, 2024, to receive building permits before the applicant will be required to return the site to pre-existing conditions or upgraded to meet town standards. Failure to comply with this timeline would result in a violation of this approval. Is there a second? I second it, Madam Chair. Seconded by Rick Meinking. Seeing uh, no hands waving. Uh, Doreen, will you call the roll, please? Rachel Hendrickson? Yes. Rick Meinking? Yes. Jennifer Ladd? Yes. Jim Hebert? Yes. And Roger Beeler? Yes. Congratulations. Thank you very much. That has been approved. Your sketch plan is going through, and we look forward to seeing you. And I you have a very ambitious time frame. Hope you can do it. All right. Thank you very much for working with us, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Stay safe tomorrow with the snow. Yes, as I said, the, the, town, the, town, the town hall is uh, closed tomorrow. So. Uh, yeah, well, it's raining when I got here. And uh, what it means for me is my 8 a.m. meeting is canceled in the town, in the town hall is canceled. And, yeah. uh, item 6.01, minor development reviews. Eric? Uh, similarly to the last planning board meeting, um, I think I updated the board that IDEX uh, was going to be submitting for a minor development review uh, of realignment of the rear drive aisle to accommodate a, a small 12 by 12 nitrogen tank and pad. Uh, They're also proposing to reconfigure and eliminate a couple of the planter boxes to accommodate some, some outdoor seating, uh, as well as show the uh, configuration of the private drive shared with uh, next gen lot 35. Um, that is currently being reviewed. Um, staff really has no comments on it. We are just awaiting the fire department's um, approval of the tank size, as we understand that uh, tanks of a certain size could require state <clears throat> fire marshal approval. Thank you. Uh, 602 administrative amendment report. On the administrative side of things, uh, I think we updated the board last time, but we have now received the uh, formal application. Hannaford, as it goes to fit up the former Shaw's building at 417 Payne Road is proposing an addition a clink building in the parking lot towards the rear. 
Um, we are currently reviewing that at the moment. Thank you. Correspondence. <clears throat> Not at this time. Planning board comments. I have one question. Sure. Um, uh, in the Portland Press Herald last week or two weeks ago, there was the landfill stopped accepting sludge article. Um, how does that directly, does that affect us at all? I guess this is a question for you, Autumn. Like what are the implications of that for us, if there are any? There are implications of that. We have our projects have to get approval from the sanitary district if they're going to be utilizing their services. So we are in um, direct contact with their um, director of operations, and so we're awaiting some legislative decisions. We'll keep you posted. Okay, thanks. Yeah, te technically, as, as a planning board, we can continue <laughs> to hear things, but we can't approve things. So that if it come if it does come down to that, rather than create a queue going back, you know, to two years from now, um, we could hear sketch plans. We could take a look at site review plans. We could not move them forward if there is no access to sewer. Uh, but what that would mean is we we kind of can start some stuff so that when the sewer problem is settled. Excuse me, excuse the expression there. Um, that people can come back at least partway done with their their applications. Um, but said we can't we can't prove anything. Gotcha. Understood. And staff is also working, um, trying to be a little more communicative to the sanitary district. Um, they have uh, asked for our list of projects that we have uh, for ongoing reviews. Um, and then we sent them a brief uh, bulleted list of uh, projects that we've had discussions on with folks who we anticipate will submit just so that they can kind of get a handle on what might be coming forward. So, mm. And this would be for projects, only for projects that are gonna be tied to public sewer. Yes, yes. So if it, if it were a single family home out, out, out in West Scarborough. Like a leach field, would, yeah. Yeah. yeah, gotcha. Thank you. Any other? Board questions, comments? Rick. Yeah, I'd just like to thank the planning department for registering a few of us for that uh, MMA class. Um, looking forward to attending that. Thank you. Uh, they may not let us all sit together because we may, you know, cause, cause trouble, but we'll be there. I still have my spit gun. <laughs> Any other comments? Um, thank you all. I, I do want to uh, honor Rick DePerry. Um, he and I came on the planning board at the same time. Uh, what has been going on is uh, CMP is pulling him out for just about everything. So he has not been able to come the way to the meetings the way he's wanted to. Uh, he, his letter of resignation indicated that he was hoping he would be able when his work settles down, that he would be able to serve uh, on, a, on this committee again or on another committee uh, and provide community service to the town. So thank you. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. We are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>